Good morning, everyone. I'll be introducing the next speaker, Dr. Gaurav Chadda. Uh, Dr. Gaurav Chadda is the director of Center for Hope, working since 2006 in the field of rehabilitation. He is certified autism movement, sensory integration, brain gym, motor planning, therapy provider. He has conducted over 20 programs on sexuality training across North India and is certified sex educator for special needs. I welcome Dr. Gaurav Chetta. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Am I? Yeah. So, my study is on sexuality training. It's quite untouchable topic. And uh, why I'm into this, uh, I'm a physiotherapist by profession. And uh, as uh, ma'am told me that I'm running a special school with residential facilities in Delhi. And uh, I used to live with 30 kids every day. So we have kids, we have adolescents, we have adults with the special needs. So I have faced so many challenges. So that challenges pushed me and uh, created interest to learn about this topic. And I studied on this topic, research work on this topic. So I'm going to share my study and research. I hope I'll, it will be helpful to you also. So why the need of the research? Why to learn sexuality training? So the point one is sexuality training is alarming, but neglected part in special education. Uh, I'm, uh, I know that we have I, we made IAPs for the kids, for the adolescents. But this is a point, we don't take it. We don't generally push them for learning. So this is a point that to create interest in this. The uh, second point is training help kids to manage their future goals. So if we wish to send our special needs for vocational rehabilitation in future, then they should know how to manage sexually in this society, like how to managing their sexual needs or how to escape from behavior, sexual behavior. So that is the main thing that we need to learn or train them before sending them to vocational rehabilitation. So training helps special needs to live functionally and independently well-structured in society. If the, uh, and if any adolescent with special needs living with lifetime in, uh, with the help of caretaker, then they should know that how to manage with other ones. So this is a point that I'm presenting my study over here. So myths about sexuality training. Many of mainstream community people think that people with IDs are asexual. That means if they have motor issues, if they have physical issues, if they have learning issues, they cannot or they do not learn about sexuality. People with intellectual disabilities are childlike and innocent. Many of offenders think about this, that they are childlike. They may not express the whatever happened with them, so easily abusing them. People with ID cannot control their sexual needs. Many of our experiencing that few autistic kids masturbate in the public. So we think that they cannot, they cannot manage their needs or they cannot learn how to manage their sexual needs. <clears throat> so many of parents have assumed that if the uh, milestones are delayed, the, the maturity, the puberty may also occur on the delaying position. So another myth is that they will not marry they will not have children, that there is no need to train them in sexuality. So that are the clear myths now. Come to the facts, all people are sexual beings needing affection, love, intimacy, acceptance and companionship. Everyone, special needs, normal one, everyone needs it. So children with developmental disabilities may learn at a slower, slow rather than peer with the, but yet the physical maturation usually occur at the same pace, that we should know it before training them. So need of sexuality training, that is me too. Everyone must be about that me too. There was a campaign running on social media a few years back. So if our kids or special needs are not trained, they cannot participate in, this, in that campaign. In campaign. They, they cannot express what happened with them if they get abused at all. So it was a, uh, there was a reason to starting this program. So it's hard luck by chance, a, a study shows that Few of AS, 24 percent of ASD kids are engaged in paraphilic sexual fantasies. You know what? Paraphilic sexual fantasies. 
These are recurrent, intense, sexually arousing urges, fantasies of behavior that are distressing, hurting, and involves objects, other kids, and non-consenting -con adults. So, there is a study that shows that girls with autism have major issues in managing menstrual issues. Excessive bleeding, painful periods, irregular cycles. And there is one more study that shows that few of ASD girls experience seizures while menstrual period and after the menstrual period. That is PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. 92% of autistic women and 46% of ASD women show symptoms of PMDD, whereas it's very few in the normal population. Fine. So uh, there is a, one more study that shows that estrogen influences the same chemicals in the brain that influences the, uh, that are affected by the ADSD, and that are dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. So what is PMDD? That's a severe form of PMS. In addition to PMS, they may, the, the, kid, the girl may have symptoms of anger, anxiety, panic attacks, le, low concentration, fatigue, body aches, low energy, insomnia, and headaches. So suppose I'm a therapist and, and I'm treating somewhere, somewhere, and I'm treating a girl with these symptoms. Somewhere, it cannot understand the condition. The, the, the autistic cannot help us to do this. So I'm just sharing a few scenarios. Scenario one, Rita is a girl of 15 years old. She has ASD. She has problem to manage her own periods and finding difficult to know where to change her pads and how to position the pads securely in her underwear. This is a position where we think as a professional that they should know this. Another scenario, Raju, 18 years, moderate ID boy, they, he doesn't know how to wear underwear and where to wear underwear. This is a point. Because from the beginning, we, uh, we take his kids as a kid, till the adolescent and the adult. This is a point as a parent with us. So this is a thing nowadays. Everyone is like smartphone addictor now. So the adult contents on the reels, that's not suitable for the kids. That is a thing we should learn. So I'm going to start my study. I took 22 cases from my center, 15 are boys, 7 are girls, had no prior information of IQ in participant. You may ask that, why 22 kids only? Because parents were not ready for, for their kids for this study. So I had 22 kids for that. So my tool was uh, developmental of sexuality educational needs assessment checklist. That was uh, created by Shilpa Man and her team. And they were all were working in NEPMED. NEPMED is National Institute of Empowering Persons with Disabilities. And it's a government of India body. So why to use this tool? So uh, before applying any intervention or any protocol, we need to know the, we need to assess the child and we need to know the current level of the performance. So assessment can be considered the systemic collection, current level of awareness and knowledge of the skills. So it has two uh, versions. Oh, you may say, uh, one is adolescent version that is from 11 to 7 year kids suitable for 7 year cases and adult version is for suitable for 18 to 35 years cases. So uh, both versions consist 50 items further subdivided into 5 domains and they were relevant for assessing, planning and training in relation with sexuality education for special needs. So items were observable and measurable and worded with the simple language. All the items were arranged in logical sequence in each domain. We'll show you the uh, versions. So this is adolescent version. So it has five domains, including 50 items. So one is, first is body awareness. So in uh, adolescent domain, we, there's a questionnaire basically, and we ask with the kid about the in identification of sexuality or identification of male and female. How, what the we, uh, male wear, the utilities male used by the males only, utilities used by the females only, utilities male used by the males only, like belts, like bracelets, how I wear shoes, what, I wear, what male men wear, what women wear, that's the uh, items. So personal care and hygiene management, how to wear underwear, where to urinate, where to go for pee, and uh, private part cleaning, relationships, how to behave with the opposite sex, how to behave your teacher, how to behave your principal, how to behave your uncle, how to behave your auntie, how to behave your father in fact, and how to behave your any close relationship in, in context to opposite sex. Healthy boundaries, if you're going for a school, 
how to behave your friends, what we, what we do if somebody touches you, risk management, if anything happened wrong with you, how will you explain it? These are some items of this uh, domain. The scoring key was zero, that is totally dependent. The number one, physical prompt, number two, score, gesture prompt, number three, verbal, and four is that is completely independent in the task. So any, that is no exposure, even not available for some times. Second domain consists, again, 50 items, body awareness. So this is second domain, this is second version, 1835, so we have some different questions. Do men shave or women shave their face? Shave their face? So uh, we talk about pubic hair, we talk about vagina, we talk about penis in this body awareness. So in about personal care, where do you masturbate? What you do you feel if you feeling masturbate in this public area? So these are some it uh, items of this domains. Healthy boundaries, how to behave with your friends, how to behave in the society, how to behave in the, at the public area, how to behave in a metro. So risk management, what will you do if somebody touches you, if your uncle touches you, if your auntie touches you? Marriage. Marriage is here is all about sharing measures. Initially, we train our kids that don't use, your, uh, uh, nobody will use your room, nobody will use your cupboard. Now, here we are asking about sharing measures. So, this is your wife, this is your husband, and they'll share your bed with you, and they'll share your uh, cupboard with you. So, that's the things that we uh, ask about this. So, uh, scoring is in snack two, that is zero, never. The behavior is never observed in the person after the intervention, pre the intervention. Number one, rarely, the behavior is seen somewhat once or twice, once a while. Sometimes the behavior is observed once a while. Three, very often the behavior is observed frequently. And four, always if the behavior is observed on a regular basis. So reliability of that tool. As per the current back alphabet, alpha reliability coefficient, the Senec 1 was found to be 0 0.94 and Senec 2 was found to be 0 0.85. Now, the score before the intervention, the average score for adolescent version was 88 and the adult, adult version was 59. The point was that, the, the distressing point for me was that many of, didn't, didn't, uh, many of uh, students didn't participate in that. They have no idea what to do, where to do, and what is that. So after the three months of intervention, 45 minutes every day, we have seen significant changes in that. The biggest achievement for me that everyone was part participated. So after the intervention, the score was 133 in the adolescent version and the one, one or two in adult version, where it was 80 and 50, 53 respectively. So this is a graphical uh, comparison of all each domains. So conclusion from my side, prioritize sexuality training in special education. Start, class, start taking classes, train them, train yourself first and train them. This is the thing that I feel that kids should know it. And uh, as a professional, I know one more thing. I, I can say one more thing. Parents are primary sex educators. 60% training given by them only. So uh, acknowledge that each and every special needs is sexual and has sexual emotions and desire. Each and every case is unique. You need to change your intervention protocols as per the conditions, but you need to follow that. Need to be careful while teaching sexuality. They may ask you, what is this? Why are you telling me to this? They may ask you. So contents of my curriculum, that training curriculum, identification of sex. I am a, so we start with the uh, with own uh, sex. I'm, if I'm training a boy, I used to treat, uh, I used to uh, intervene like, you are a male, you will be a job, you will work someday, you will learn something, you will shave your uh, face, you will shirt like this, you will wear pant like this, and now come to, she is a female, suppose uh, someone is here, she is a female, she has uh, uh, some issues, menstrual issues, you should not go there, you should not touch her bra, you should not touch her inner ears, you should not touch her utilities, and that's her own utilities, that's not utility. So this is the way we train our kids. Managing menstrual care, managing periods, managing uh, learning them through calendar matters, use tampons, use cups, train them in using cuppings, train them in tampons, and maintaining hygiene, maintaining that uh, intimate wash, care of private parts, sorry. So my team 
uh, was parents. It's a big challenge for me to attend, uh, in, involving them in this uh, study. Special educators, therapists, gynecologists, hormone specialists, and neurologists. So, uh, as per my opinion, use appropriate aids for teaching sexuality, like visual models, doll, actual clothes, and sanitary pads. Use actual exercise like role play and drama. I was talking with someone, ma'am, is there, and we were talking like drama therapy is best for them because they can understand the things concretely. Interactive sessions, take one to one sessions, use concrete strategies to train them in sexuality. Cover age appropriate sexual issues like I'm a 20 year old boy, I have autism. Ask if, if, if I'm talking with sexuality with someone, talk about uh, human relationships, about feelings, about love, about masturbation issues. If 20 years old, if you are in training for 20 year old boy, you can talk about this. Use photos, pictures, family trees that we make in the early intervention program. Use teachable moments in a daily life. Like we are going for a marriage and the bride and groom will have kids after one year. So train them, train the teachable moments in life. Fine, start training in the young age and don't wait until puberty. Start training by five, this is your private part. This is your, you should kept in the underwear, you should kept in, uh, cover in the public place. So try, start training by the early intervention program. Use accurate language of body parts and bodily function. You should use the word penis. You should word, use the word vagina. So that they can understand well. Find the best time for training. Anytime. Do you think that kid is fine? He can learn. He can uh, understand the things. Start by now. So my references. Thank you. Teacher service. That is a point, actually. That is a point. And that is a point. Also how were yeah, exactly. I was using the word penis in Virginia. Yeah. So it's, it's okay, no issue. But you should think of this and you should work on this. Yeah, exactly. Train yourself first. Create your, clean your mind first, then clean them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It's really nice to be here, and we're going to have Dr. Temple with us live right now. Dr. Temple does not need an introduction. Can you tell I'm one of the biggest fans here? But Dr. Richard will introduce her. No, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin. Um, Dr. Grandin is an American academician, behavioral animal behaviorist and internationally renowned spokesperson for autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Grandin is one of the first autistic people to demonstrate the insights that she has gained from her personal experience of autism. She is currently a faculty member with animal sciences in the College of Agricultural Sciences at Colorado State University. Based on her experience, Grandin advocates early intervention to address autism and support teachers and professionals who can redirect children and adults with um, in fruitful decisions and directions. She has been an outspoken proponent of animal rights and the neurodiversity movements. In 2010, Temple Grand was listed as one of the 10 most influential people in the world by Time 100, which named her in the heroes category. In 2011, she received a double helix medal and has received many honorary degrees from many universities, including McGill, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Carnegie Mellon, etc. Grandin has been featured on many media programs. She was the subject of an Emmy and Golden Globe winning biographical film, Temple Grandin. In 2018, Grandin was featured in the documentary, This Business of Autism, which explored autism employment and the success of autism employers. She has been written up in Time, People Magazine, Discover, Forbes, and the New York Times. She is best known for designing the Hug Machine, which is a deep pressure gadget planned to calm extremely sensitive people, which are ordinary people with autism, 
And I know her personally working with her as a colleague to sequence her entire genome. To read the chromosomes from end to end and make sense of that as to how they caused her condition and how they continue to influence her life. And I'll never forget the working with her to do that. And if you're interested in what we found out, um, come to my lecture tomorrow at 11 something. So I'm um, introduced, I'm um, Dr. Grandin. Well, it's good to be here. And also a lot of emphasis on skills, like getting dressed, combing your hair, brushing your teeth, um, eating with utensils. Well, if you, one little tip with these kids, you have to give them time to respond. They're like a phone that's only got one bar of service. And slow down when you talk to them. And when the grown-ups talked fast, it went to gibberish. Can you put the next slide up, please? Now, the thing about autism is it goes all the way from Einstein, who had no speech until age three, to somebody who has much more severe um, uh, um, autism when they become nonverbal, but some of the ones that are nonverbal can learn to type independently. But a brain can be more social emotional, or a brain can be more interested in what they do. And having an interesting career has been very important to me. I'm I'm really happy that I'm a professor. I've got graduate students and I've done a lot of research in animal behavior. I have three graduate students that have become university professors. I'm very, very happy about that. So a brain can be more social, emotional, or a brain can be more interested sort of in what they do. This is why I think it's important to get kids out doing interesting things. Um, some of these kids that get addicted to video games, um, one of the ways to get them off the video games is have them fix motorcycles, have them fix cars. It's the one thing that's worked. They find out that maybe fixing those motorcycles is much more interesting than the video games. And that's something that can turn into a career. And it's a skill that other people want. Let's go to the next slide. Shows a picture of Thomas Edison. Uh, he would probably be autistic today. He dropped out of school. Now, fortunately, he had a mentor. And he had um, a mentor that taught him how to use the telegraph. It's really important for students to get exposed to things. I didn't originally, I was not originally in the cattle industry. I got exposed to it as a teenager. And I had very good teachers and mentors starting with my mother when I was very young. She was always pushing me to do new things. She encouraged my ability in art. Um, I had a wonderful uh, primary school teacher. I had a wonderful science teacher who got me interested in studying with all kinds of interesting projects to do. Um, good teachers are so important. Let's go to the next slide. There's Einstein. He would probably be in an autism program today. Let's go to the next slide. Put the next slide up, please. Now, I'm a kind of a NASA fan. And I, I got five years ago, I got a chance to go visit uh, Cape, uh, visit this launch pad. Uh, this was like so much fun. And what I learned when I went there is the astronauts, uh, they, may have, they had the, we call it the right stuff. But they were people that had Tourette syndrome, that were dyslexia. They were building la the launch pad. They were um, uh, designing control rooms. There were people there at NASA, really smart people, that were, you know, some of them probably were on the autism spectrum. I've been to many, many NASA sites. And if you look at the old um, videos of going to the moon, look at the people in that control room. I think there was quite a few autistic people there. And they were really happy that they got to be involved in that project. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I've got emotions, but I get emotional over interesting stuff I do. And um, Voyager spacecraft now is 45 years old. The scientists are in their 80s now. They are still tracking it. They've managed to keep it going. For a long time, they had to work out of a storefront next to a McDonald's, but they kept it operating with no funds. And I can get really into that because it's so cool what they're doing. They're still learning from this spacecraft that's 45 years old. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, past Saturn, we can go to the next slide. And then you've got the um, you've got the techies down there that keep that antenna going. Yeah, they probably have to do it at three o'clock in the morning. I got a chance to sit at the original um, uh, mission control um, desk. That was really, really cool. Go to the next slide. Now let's not get hung up on the labels. 
autism is this big spectrum. And the problem with autism is they keep changing the diagnosis. Originally, you know, maybe you know, 30 years ago or so, you had to have speech delay to be labeled autistic. And then they added Asperger's syndrome, where you could be socially awkward, no speech delay. And then in 2013, they merged everything together. And you've got a spectrum that's going from Einstein to somebody that may have much more severe uh, problems. But I can't emphasize enough on working with the little kids, because when I was three, I looked very, very severe. And we can go to the next slide. I have grandparents that come up to me all the time, and they find out they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. That just happens all the time. And sometimes adults later in life getting diagnosed helps them with their relationships. But I'm concerned that too many fully verbal, smart kids on the spectrum get so hung up on the label, the parents get hung up on the label, that the kid's not learning basic skills like shopping, learning how to save money, doing laundry, just very, very basic things. Another big problem I'm seeing is not making the transition into the world of work. Work skills are not the same skills as academic skills. We need to start children when they're 11 years old, maybe I'm volunteering at a fruit stand or something like that, where they learn how to work for somebody outside the family on a schedule. Go to the next slide. Now that's uh, me uh, having a real fun time at the vehicle assembly building. We'll show another slide. All the cool stuff I got to go do there, like go up on the roof and I wasn't supposed to. That was really cool. All right, let's just get back to the uh, getting important stuff in autism. Let's talk about some basic issues here. Sudden surprises scare. Okay, let's say a child's going to go to a new school. We'll try to visit it maybe before they go there or look at the website. Um, the other thing um, that's difficult for a lot of individuals with autism is multitasking, when you rapidly have to multitask. But we've got to get these kids out doing stuff. We've just got to do that. And I was brought up in the 50s, and we used a method I call it teachable moments. So let's say I took my drink right here, and I stirred it with my finger. That's, not, that's bad table manners. Now, my mother, instead of saying no, she would say, use the spoon. People think it's disgusting when you put your finger in the cup. She would give the instruction instead of saying no. That was a, my generation, a method of teaching social skills. And social skills were taught in a much more structured manner than they are today. We need to limit the screen time, the phones and the computers, to about an hour a day. And we need to get kids out doing things on... Um, today, I saw some kids out playing in the playground that's near my house, and that's the kind of stuff that kids should be doing. Let's go to the next slide. So there's the teacher there working with a really young kid. And the thing I have found on very young children's programs, some teachers just have the ability to work with these little kids. Now, if you've got a little kid that's not talking, the worst thing you can do is let them just sit and play with a phone all day. That's the worst thing you can do. You need to get an effective teacher working with them. And I find some teachers have the ability and some don't. Let's go to the next slide. Teaching turn-taking. That was done with me with board games. You have to learn how to wait. That's something that's very important for young autistic children to learn how to wait. And we'll go on to the next slide. Teachable moments, we already talked about that. You don't yell and say, stop it. You give the instruction and the reason why. Let's go to the next slide. You need to limit the video games. One of the things that I was not allowed to do when I was in high school was just become a recluse in my room. I was not a good student, I was a terrible student, but I still had to attend the classes. You know, too many of these kids are just getting on the electronics and just staying in their room, playing video games all day, and they're not getting wonderful jobs in the video game industry. And if they were getting wonderful jobs in the video game industry, I'd be a lot more positive about it. But some young adults, again, addicted to video games, the one thing that was successful in getting them off of it was working on motors and engines. And they found out that they were more interesting than the video games. Let's go to the next slide. Now, my mother would always stretch me to do new things, but she always gave me a choice. 
you know, we could go to this store or that store, or you could do this activity or some other activity. Always giving choices. You can do your homework when you get home from school, or you can do your homework after dinner. Giving some choices. And one of the things that helped me uh, being raised in the 50s is um, we had sit down dinners. And, you know, the, my sister and my parents would take turns telling about their day. Unfortunately, in some families, um, that's not happening. And this was part of um, part of uh, getting me to be a lot more social. And and you can learn business social. Another thing that was done in my family is when we were seven or eight years old, and it was done with most of the families in my generation, is when I was a little kid, I had to dress up in my good clothes when the parents had a party. And I had to serve the snacks. I had to shake hands with them, learn how to talk to them. Really, really good social training. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about sensory issues. Sensory issues are really real. And loud sounds like a school bell or a hair dryer or maybe a vacuum cleaner would hurt my ears. Now, one of the ways to help a child to tolerate these sounds is to let the child play with the vacuum cleaner where they turn it on, they turn the hair dryer on. And when the child turns the dreaded noisy thing on, they often get to where they can tolerate it better because they are controlling it. Now there's some kids wearing headphones all the time. And the problem is if you wear headphones all the time and that's on the next slide, um, the sound sensitivity may get worse. So what you want to do is have them with you. You can have them in your backpack. So they're with you. They give you the control. You've got them with you. But then you try not to wear them. because you, I've heard stories where they were wearing headphones all the time and the child got so sensitive, he couldn't tolerate quiet conversation at the dining room table. But sensory problems really are real. Um, sensory integration methods can be helpful. There's a paper you can look up online that's called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. And it's a method where you stimulate two senses at the same time, um, maybe touch a, a warm uh, coffee cup and then um, uh, smell some uh, aromatherapy. So you're stimulating two senses at the same time. And the title of the paper is Environmental Enrichment, an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, let's say we have a nonverbal older child or adult and, and problems with maybe destructive behavior or hitting. The first thing with somebody who cannot speak is give them a way to communicate. Not being able to communicate is totally frustrating. Also, you have to rule out, do they have a painful medical problem that they can't tell you about? That's the first thing you made to make sure they don't have acid reflux. I had acid reflux last night because I ate some hot sauce. I wish I hadn't eaten. And I, 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 uh, you know, my, my stomach was hurting last night. Uh, but, the, but the sensory overload, if they have a, a, you know, a meltdown or outburst in a busy, noisy store, that is probably sensory overload. But we've also got to give them a way to communicate. That is just super, super important. Um, there's a next slide just shows that sensory symptoms are part of the neurobiology of autism. Now, when I was a little kid, they tested me for two things, deafness and epilepsy. Now I could pass the deafness test, but the problem is my ability to hear auditory details impaired. Like if the grownups talk fast, it was when, Adults talked fast, it was like blah, 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 blah. that's what it sounded like. Because I didn't hear the the hard constant sounds. Like if someone said the word cat and they said it fast, I would hear ah. So my speech teacher would say cat ta, or she'd hold up a cup and she'd say cup pa. And she switched back and forth between saying cup and cup pa. Because if people talked fast, then all I heard were the vowel sounds. Stretch out and enunciate the, um, the consonants. And, and sometimes um, I'm hearing would kind of cut in and out like a bad mobile phone uh, connection. There's kind of three ways that the brain can have a problem with language. 
I'm not hearing the auditory detail where I'm hearing gibberish, blah, 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 blah. trouble with getting my speech out expressive. And then the next slide, I talk about echolalic children and echolalic children, they have good speech and they will recite an entire movie script. But the problem is they don't know what the movie script means. That's the problem. So in Life Animated, what these parents did is they this uh, child had memorized Disney movie and they um, picked out phrases in the movie that could be used in real life. And then they, their son started to figure out um, that words had meaning. So an echolalic kid, you've got to teach them that all this language you're yakking out has meaning. So it's kind of three ways the brain can be messed up. The next slide talks about attention shifting slowness. Now, if I was a computer, I've got a very, very small, um, you know, I'm an Intel 286. I mean, if you're a computer geek, uh, that's the first chip. But I have huge memory. Attention shifting slowness. This is why you have to give the child time to respond. The next slide shows attention shifting slowness. It's an old Ami Klin slide. And look at how the uh, normal person's looking at the eyes. But the other more important thing in this slide is look at how many times the normal person looked back and forth compared to the autistic person who's trying to lip read. Tension shifting slowness. All right, now let's look at things where this could cause a problem at work. I want to see these kids get employed and I want to avoid the jobs such as rapid multitasking at a McDonald's takeout window. That would be a very bad job. Another problem is. I don't have any working memory. So if um, let's say I have to like shut down the cash register at night at a store and then maybe five or six steps, I need to write them down. I need to write the steps down like a pilot's checklist. Long yakety yak strings of verbal information do not work with me. Let me make a pilot's checklist. Okay, and if you don't wanna disclose autism, just say to your employer, pilots need a checklist, I need one too. And for pilots, it's mandatory. In every country in the world, pilots have to use checklists. Now, I'm talking about giving the child uh, time to respond. When I was five years old in school, we had a little assignment where we had to name the pictures that began with B as in beautiful. So I called the suitcase a bag and the teacher marked it wrong. And she didn't give me time to explain that in our house, there weren't suitcases. They were bags, and that was very, very frustrating for me. In the next slide, we're going to be talking about some visual problems. I don't have visual processing problems, but some individuals do, and vision might break up similar to a migraine headache, or this next slide that shows an image that's breaking up. Uh, uh, seeing probably wouldn't be a primary sense if that's the way things look like. And this may explain why a number of people that do not speak touch and smell things, because those senses provide um, uh, accurate information. And we'll go on to the next slide that shows an escalator. Now, in your brain, um, you have the eyes that work like a camera. But then in the back of the brain, there's circuits that assemble the graphics file for shape, color, motion, and texture. And there's something wrong with those circuits. Print may jiggle on the page when you try to read. These kids are often terrified of escalators because they can't tell how to get on and off of it. So you have a child that hates an escalator. The chances are it has a visual processing problem and, and the eye exam may be more or less normal. And if you have a child that can't read, um, the next slide shows print jiggling on the paper. Uh, try different pale colored papers. Now, this is my children's project book right here. Oh, um, you see the light blue paper color right there. Try printing on um, uh, the, uh, the homework and the reading materials on maybe light tan paper, light gray paper, all these different colored papers. That sometimes really works for some types of dyslexia. Just try different colored paper. Try different colored backgrounds on your computer, on your laptop, or on the iPad. The next slide, I talk about lighting issues. And one of the big ones now is LED lights that flicker. 
And one of the ways that you can determine if LED lights are bad is take pictures of them in slow motion. So you want to wave like this, because when you play it back, you want to make sure it's playing back in slow motion. And you're going to find some flat screen TVs that flicker. Now, tablets do not flicker. Most laptops do not flicker. But there's going to be some flat screen TV mo um, computer monitors that are bad. And this does not affect all, all people with autism. But I'm going to say that 10 or 20 percent may have a problem with seeing flicker of, of LED lights or on uh, TVs and computer monitors. So what do you do if you have that problem? You go buy a lamp and you find an LED light that does not flicker and you put it next to the desk. and the, the, you can buy cheap ones that don't flicker. But this is something that's a real problem. And when I get asked about designing this uh, school or a home for people with autism, I want to make sure we have LED lights that do not flicker. I just learned from a technical specialist that if a TV flickers, it has to do with the internet connection. Um, but this, this kind of stuff um, needs to be fixed, and you can just test it with slow motion video. The next slide just talks about some more severe um, sensory issues. In noisy environments, I am not able to hear because of all the background noise. Cannot hear. Um, and I also cannot follow very rapid chit-chat conversations where people get very social, chit-chatting back and forth very rapidly. I get bored with that. Um, and this question's coming up about masking. Um, some of that stuff's just too hard for me to do. But you can always do some business social. You know, shake hands with people. There are some individuals that need breaks. Um, but sensory problems are real. Let's go on to the next slide. The next slide um, talks about this environmental enrichment program where you use inexpensive, cheap things to stimulate two senses at the same time. You're always changing the things that you stimulate and it's an adjunct or an add-on to other types of therapy. Now, the next slide shows some really wonderful books for um, um, that have been written by non-speaking um, autistics. Now, I really like um, How Can I Talk My Lips Don't Move by Tito. I had a chance to meet Tito, and he came into a library, and he was flapping and, and everything, and I wanted to see... Um, I tested him with a really, really strange picture that he had never seen before. And it had an astronaut in a spacesuit riding a horse out in the desert. And I showed that to Tito and he types really fast, Apollo 11 on a horse. Another good book's Carly Fleischman's, uh, um, Arthur Fleischman's Carly's Voice. Then you've got The Reason I Jump, the sequel to The Reason I Jump. I like the sequel, it's a better book. But I'll give you a little tip about the typing. Remember the problem with attention shift. Okay, like on this desktop, my keyboard's way down here. But when I type, that print appears way up here on the screen here, and the keyboard's down below where the video is. Now, many people with autism cannot make that attention shift. And that's the reason why you want to use a tablet, because the virtual keyboard, with using that virtual keyboard, the writing appears right next to the top of the keyboard. Or you're going to have to, on a laptop, put the keyboard on a box, and you need to make sure it's a monitor that does not flicker. This is really, really important. Next slide just shows some brain scans. And the point I want to get across right there, different parts of the brain get turned on when you do different things, like seeing things, hearing words, thinking about things. And where there's a problem in autism is in kind of the inter-office communications. And what you tend to get is uneven skills. Like I'm really good at art and mechanical stuff. Somebody else might be really good at mathematical stuff. And we'll just show some more pretty brain scans. Um, next slide shows, oh, that's my skull. Let's show the next slide. That's the microbiome. And you see the little tiny hairs there? Uh, those are axon tails. And they form great big uh, inter-office communication cables between different parts of the brain. And then I can show you a slide without my ugly skull. And that's the connectome is much prettier when it's by itself. The next slide shows the circuit in the brain for speak what you see. Now there's the normal control right there. And I'll show you mine. Next slide. That's my speak what you see. 
and I have all these extra branches for visual thinking, but I have less fibers for speech. So that might explain why I had trouble getting my speech out. But when I had speech therapy, it increases the bandwidth on the fibers that are still left. And the next slide just shows that. And, but this is where the therapy made a difference because I had trouble getting my speech out. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if I speak what I hear, I am definitely not an auditory person. I am definitely a visual person. And we'll go on to the next slide. And I want to talk about the importance of developing strengths. That's an artwork I did when I was about six or seven years old. Mother always encouraged my ability in art. It's a picture of a wooden uh, a dock or deck that was um, by the beach. And she always encouraged my, um, my art. And the next slide just shows a picture a young child did in three-dimensional. Most little kids don't do that. And I would just draw the same horse's head over and over and over again. So mother would broaden my skill. Let's draw the stable. Let's draw the saddle. Or if you have a child that likes cars, let's read about cars, do math with cars, draw pictures of different cars. In other words, broaden that fixation. Broaden the fixation, especially with something like cars that can turn into a career. The next slide just talks about um, um, the art ability being encouraged. I uh, often will have uneven skills, really good at art. I was absolutely terrible at mathematics. But then you're going to have another autistic person that's good at math. And we'll go to the next slide where it shows that the way I think it's videos in my head or movies in my head. I'm what's called an object visualizer. And in my new book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions, I discuss three different kinds of thinking that you can have in autism. Most people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. But in autism, you might get an extreme object visualizer. That's me. And the HBO movie shows how I think. My kind of mind's good at art, mechanical things, photography, working with animals, absolutely terrible in mathematics. And then you have the next kind of mind is the visual spatial mathematical mind. And the mathematical mind thinks in patterns. And then you have people that think in words. And it's important to you know kind of know how the child thinks. That just shows eclipse shadows on um, where the eclipse um, the uh, trees made, made little tiny eclip uh, eclipses like pinhole camera. That happened on our campus. I noticed detail. I watched a whole bunch of students just walk over that. They just didn't notice it, but I noticed visual detail. The next slide shows two things that can bother cattle like seeing a car through the fence, seeing a piece of red string, seeing a bottle there that might move. Little things that um, people don't notice. Also in autism, there is a better, um, there's some uh, better ability to uh, pitch discrimination. Um, there's been a lot of research that shows that these sensory things really, really are real. And the next slide shows one of my cattle handling facilities. and. One of the, how did I sell my work? One of the things I did to sell my work was to show off pictures of things I had designed. And one thing I really liked in the HBO movie is that it showed my actual projects. It also shows how I think in pictures. It's very, very accurate on that. And I can say that the uh, geek side of me really liked that. The next slide shows on... Um, a recreation of one of my projects in the HBO movie. I thought that was just so cool. I really, really liked that. The next slide shows uh, starting on my very first project. Now, I had some good mentors in the construction industry. On my first project, the Swift plant, 1974, I criticized some welding and I said it looked like a bird had poo pooed on it. And that was pretty rude. And the plant engineer pulled me into his office in private and said, I had to apologize for that rude kind of talk. He told me what I should do. And then another person that helped me was a small contractor, steel and concrete work contractor, who had seen my drawings and seeked me out. And for 10 years, we built projects together. And so those are on a construction site, some of my early projects, and some of the most fun stuff I ever did was working in construction. 
And I worked with a lot of people that were probably dyslexic, ADHD, or autistic. Some of these people owned big companies where they made mechanical equipment. They had lots of patents. This I really put the emphasis on the career. This is what's made life uh, happy for me, is having a fulfilling career. The next slides just show some of my drawings. And, and when I showed people my drawings, they were impressed. That's how I sold jobs. Okay, let's work on what are we going to do about job interviews? Well, a job interview for me was lay the drawings on the table and show off the drawings. That's what I did. And they'd look at my drawings and go, well, in fact, actually today, now that everything's computerized drawings, I'm seeing some very bad drawings. And uh, now the next drawing shows a dipping vat system. And you can see on the concrete work, I have all the reinforcing rods drawn in there. Uh, four years ago, I got a really horrible set of drawings <laughs> that the uh, engineering firm had done on a computer and they didn't hadn't drawn in the reinforcing rods. I marked them all in pencil. And I said, you go back to the engineering firm and, and get it done right. This is a piece of equipment I developed for the meat industry called the center track restrainer system. You can see a lot of complicated steel work there. And one of the people I worked on this was autistic, undiagnosed. Special ed department builds the stuff. And we need these skills. We need to find back doors into jobs you know, where you just kind of bypass the interview and get jobs. Well, you know, a friend that has a store and maybe they'd be willing to work with the kid. I think I'm going to stop there. You can have the rest of the slides because I'd like to do questions. And I've already talked about some of the most important stuff. But that what you see right there is high end skilled trades. And I'm uh, I was very interested though. I went to the Steve Jobs Theater right before COVID shut everything down. And the glass walls came from Italy and Germany and the carbon fiber roof came from Dubai. That's very, very high end skill to trades. That's something to be proud of. All right, let's get some questions going right now. Hope I'm gonna get some questions. Hello? Hello? Yes, let's get some questions. Yeah, just a second. Hi, my name is Sona. I have a son, he is nearly eight years old. And I always have this uh, question because uh, I'm a big fan of you and I know you know a lot about autism and animal behavior. So I wanted to ask, what's the connection between visual sensory preference as um, my cats and my son, they both like similar toys and uh, they have similar visual preference. Is there now, any does link? Your son, does your son speak? He is speaking, but he is not like uh, having any big vocabulary. So he has very short vocabulary and has sensory issues. What do you have? Does he have a decent way to communicate? Even something out like one of these computerized. Um, things that will speak or a picture board or something that for him to communicate with? No, we never use like visual uh, pictures like pecs. We never use those. So we um, encouraging him to use more spontaneous speech and uh, you know, the speech therapist, the ABA therapist, all of them, what they recommend, we follow that. Well, does it, if he can learn to speak, then you don't need to use pecs. But yeah. if you have a child that has like three word vocabulary mm -hmm. and is eight years old, we need to give him another way to communicate more easily. Mm -hmm. And that, I can remember the frustration when I, uh, when I couldn't communicate. And I remember that, uh, I showed you that picture of the bicycle in the suitcase. And it was so frustrating when the teacher didn't give me time to explain that in our house suitcases were bags. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand the concept of the letter B, the sound of the letter B. Uh, uh, but, but he, uh, there's a point where, where uh, they need to get get a better way to communicate. Yeah, some kids can sign the language. Some kids uh, can. Uh, there's various programs you can get for tablets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is, he started talking uh, just uh, before he gets six, 
So it's really delayed. So that's why. But is he starting to talk? Are you getting more and more language? Yes, yes, and okay. more clarity. Like it takes time. Like it's a step by step. But we had uh, him from severe autism. Now he is in between low and moderate autism. Okay. So well, in the spectrum. Good. If you're getting progress. Uh, parents yeah. always ask me about different programs. I said the most important thing is you're getting progress. Yes, now, if you're getting have... progress right now, then you're doing the right thing. Yes, the only problem I'm struggling is his memory and his sensory problems. That kind of restrict him to learn more and focus on uh, uh, tasks and academics. And he's better in maths. As you say, there are a few types of visual learners. He is more into maths and numbers l rather than alphabets and okay, reading. Okay. Because I told, said there's a visual kind of autism, that's me. Yeah. But there's also a mathematical. There are kids that are very mathematical. He is visual in math. maths, but he's not very visual in. Uh, he's not into reading that much, but he's better in maths, like counting and numbers. He's okay. really good well, with numbers. Good. Then he maybe maybe can move him ahead in numbers. But uh, how is he at things like getting dressed, uh, bathing? These kinds of he is very independent. Wherever I taught him, is very independent. Good, good. That that is that's good. He's learning those skills. Yeah, he is even better than my other children, like um, tip, neurotypical ones. So he is more independent than them, and he understands routine better than them. The only problem I have, I can't find uh, his special skill. He really likes music. And he is very athletic. He does parkour. He does uh, swimming. He does cycling. Well, good. He's, he's very athletic. That's good. And see, the problem you got with autism is it's such a wide spectrum now. Let's say you take a diagnosis like dyslexia. Okay, there's problems with reading mm -hmm. or ADHD. You know, you tend to, you know, uh, detention. It's a much narrower diagnosis. And this is the problem we've got. We've probably got to have autistic kids that have a special skill, and there's going to be some that don't really have a special skill. Yeah, he has but, autism, ADHD, and dyslexia, all three, and Erlen syndrome. Well, the Erlen syndrome, um, have you tried the Erlen glasses? Yes, I, I, I myself, I qualified uh, as well. I just took the course so I can keep checking on him. Uh, yeah, we got the glasses. Well, the other thing I find that, that works also for people that have Erlen syndrome, I talked about the colored paper. Yeah, we do use. You, okay, so yeah, we do use all of his notebooks are turquoise. Well, like, like I've got a tan shirt on right now, mm -hmm. and, and that would be one of the colors, the, the light tan like this shirt. Mm -hmm. um, some people like that, and then other, other people, they like this um, light, light blue that's on my children's project book. Yeah, 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 that uh, light blue, that's the thing for light, him, light blue, calms like him. Light blue like my tie. Yes, it see, calms it him. Needs to be the pale uh, colors. Yeah, yeah. Not, not dark blue, light blue. Yeah, I changed light those, but black. he still have sensory, visual sensory problems. So is and there any about, connection? Now, what about uh, a sound sensitivity? Sound sensitivity he has, but I uh, kind of um, always um, give him that opportunity. Like you said, he's in charge of hair dryer, okay. he's in charge of hand dryer, you know, when we go to cinema, yeah. at the beginning he was very hesitated, but then he got used to, so now he is properly sitting like other children. So I kind of make him to be prone to that, and he's used well, to it. Well, that's good that you see, you see him and making him, see when the child turns the hair dryer on and off, or the vacuum on and off, where they control it. Yes. That to desensitize some of that. Yeah, but still I'm struggling with his memory and his visual sensory. Like, my cat and him, they prefer the same toy, you know what I mean? Like, it, he will kind of keep doing with that, uh, playing with that toy, even though he has thousand other toys. Uh, but and his preference... how preferred. is he taking turns at a game? He was not good. He was having meltdowns. He would get angry. But I, I kind of uh, desensitized him with that as well, like on the cues of airport, um, like slowly, slowly by rewarding him using ABA techniques. And, well, and, you, and, you, and you don't have a surprise at the airport. You know, like you watch videos and... and uh, 
I found that one of the things that I got afraid of them, if I made them interesting. Yeah, that exactly. That uh, they, they sports. Did, what, what one parent did about the hand dryers in the bathrooms, they went to the websites of all the manufacturers of the hand dryers, and then they got interested in how they worked and they collected all the websites <laughs> of hand dryer manufacturers. No, seriously. This actually helped. Yeah, yeah, it's the same with him. Wherever we started with, like even food, diet, we started with him. At the beginning, he didn't like. Now he loves uh, healthy, you know, clean food. He wouldn't oh. eat rice before. He was addicted to all these carbs, rice. Oh, that is bad. Now he and wouldn't I get, eat. I get worried that some of these kids with these restrictive diets are going to get the old vitamin deficiency diseases. There was a horrible case where a kid got scurvy. Which yeah. is vitamin C deficiency. Because yeah. The diet was so restricted. Maybe we need to get somebody else to ask a question. I want to give somebody else a turn. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, um, good morning and nice to meet you. You made a point about uh, people who don't speak much, uh, they're more on touching and smelling things. And I just wanted to know how can that be helped and how can they be, me, uh, they be helped to speak better? Well, that if, if you want to if you read, I really recommend that you read Tito's book, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? It is available in an electronic book. I checked Amazon recently, it is available. And he talks about vision being scrambled. Also, the Japanese boy in the sequel, which I think is a better book, he talks about being like a broken robot and having problems with controlling his movements. And if you have an older child or an adult that's either non-speaking or very poor speaking, I really recommend these books because it gives the inside view of, of their issues. And I don't have scrambled vision. I see just fine. You see, this is where autism has, uh, has all, all these variations. But some of them uh, have get scrambled vision, and then smell and touch actually work. Those senses are giving accurate information, so then they tend to use them, since they work. So the, the have, wish... I the really wish. recommend, um, really, really, really recommend those books. Um, the, um, I can just, I've got a, power, a PDF here. I'll just hold up that slide again of those books right there. Oh, if you have an older kid, or an adult that doesn't speak, um, those, are, those books are going to give you so much insight. They type independently. Nobody's holding their wrist or their arm. They type completely independently, and they describe sensory scrambling. Now, I don't have this. I have sound sensitivity. And then there's some, uh, I have a student that had the problem with uh, print jingling on the page. But see, this is where the sensory stuff is so variable. This is sensory <coughs> problems a lot worse than mine is. Good morning. I have, my question is how to teach taking turns. There is a child, eight year old, he struggles with taking turns. He can't wait. And while well, playing. That, that was the reason why when I was three, uh, we spent a big part of my therapy was learning how to wait and take turns in games. Yeah, how do I teach? How do I do it? Like, uh, there, sometimes there's a video activity happening, and there are three kids. One after another, they can watch their um, favorite clip, video clip for maybe five minutes. But he can't wait for others. Well, let's, let's do something where it's shorter than five minutes. Okay. Like uh, a board game. We played a lot of Parcheesi, which is a very simple board game where you shake little cups with dice in it and you move little wooden, uh, wooden uh, pieces around on the board. And, and uh, I remember grabbing that cup and the mother said, you've got to wait for your sister to take her turn. And... Okay and something where the, it's not five minutes. Let's do some turn-taking thing where it's, you One know, like minute. you take a turn and part cheesy takes 10 seconds. Okay, so I start, with, I start with 10 seconds to, the first activity should be very uh, short. Well, but the, the thing is, the, my speech teacher that I had years ago, this would be like a 
50. Okay. Uh, she just knew that teaching the kids how to take wait and take turns was super important. My therapy had a lot of emphasis on that. All right. Thank I wait in line. Okay, you're at the supermarket and you've got to wait in line. You can't cut to the front of the line. Uh, and the, that's also chart taking. The child is able to wait in queue, but only taking turns when there's a uh, person who is talking to him. He finds it difficult. In queue, well, nobody is speaking to each other. They are facing the other way, so he finds it very easy to wait in queue. But he okay, has. Okay. But when he has to play with other children, or he has to watch a video and wait for that time, he feels that he's not given his. Uh, I, he's not having control on his activity. I don't know what is the exact feeling he has. Well, I might try different things. When we were kids, we did a lot of relay races where you'd take turns running and kicking a ball or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, try some different things that involve taking turns. Now, if you're watching videos, uh, one thing I'd recommend is the phone be physically passed. All right. The phone, the phone has to be physically Physical passed. Around. Passed. Thank you so much. And the taking turns means the phone has to be given to the other person and passed around if you're doing something on a phone. All right. I think that's going to help on the taking turns. Thank you so much. Okay, let well, me get another question. Uh, hi, Doctor. Uh, nice to meet you today. Uh, in the last five years, uh, we're hearing uh, somebody tell like, uh, autism causes by uh, TV. I want today uh, listen uh, in uh, your opinion. Caused by what? I didn't hear you. Uh, TV, TV. I don't television, tele television. TV. Caused by television? Yeah, so somebody tell that. No, no, autism is not caused by yeah. television. But if you let a uh, child spend 10 hours a day watching television, that's not, that's bad. And it'll probably make the audience worse. You know, we need to be getting them out and doing things. No, but television does not cause autism. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm Eleonora. I want to ask you what uh, do you think about the connection between language and motor coordination? Is it important to improve motor coordination in autistic children? to improve also language? What do you think? Well, there's some really interesting things that's happening with horseback riding. And I've had parents tell me that their kid did their first words on a horse. Now, there's, two, there's three things that happen on a horse. First of all, riding horses is really fun. Yeah. But the other thing is you have to balance and yeah. rhythm. You're doing balancing and rhythm at the same time. Now, occupational therapists and sensory integration might get you on on a swing and do some of the same thing. But when you stimulate the vestibular system yeah. with balance and rhythm, that can be real helpful. Another simple thing that might work is you nail a board to the floor and then you have the person walk, what we call walk the type of yeah. like this, along the board that's nailed to the floor. I mean, it's only like that part of the floor. Um, but you do these activities that stimulate the cerebellum. Yeah. Things like swinging. Um, there's a paper I worked on years ago with Warner King, and the child, and they had him on a swing and they were working on speech. And there's some good things with the motor and speech. And, and the thing that's not known is which kids respond to this. You see, this is the problem with any of these sensory things. You know, it works on one kid and another kid it doesn't work. Okay, I worked on my squeeze machine. Some okay. kids respond to deep pressure, other yeah. kids don't. Um, this is where the sensory problems are, are real very. Um, but some individuals, they do swinging, balancing, rhythmic activities. Yeah. That can help on speech for some individuals. Okay. We can use also music, for example, yeah. rhythm. And that is very important. The other yeah. thing is there are some individuals that can sing words before they speak them. Yeah. Singing is on different brain circuits, so they could sing the words rather than speak them. And Sometimes that works. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Grandin, for uh, wonderfully sharing your insights as uh, an autistic person. One thing that uh, has caught my arm is that uh, your parents, your mother, played a very key role in uh, ensuring. Absolutely. absolutely. In yeah, and then another book um, you might find helpful, you have a book called The Way I See It, that's uh, I got a lot of little short um, articles in it, uh, it's available on Amazon, um, that might be helpful. Thank um, you. Yeah, I also have a lot of information on website, templebrandon.com. There's templebrandon.com. There's lots of free information on that. Thank you. So um, I'm a mother of um, triplet boys with autism. They are 11 years old. All different. Uh, they are all on a different spectrum. And uh, one is still nonverbal. And uh, my, all my sons are really not... Um, academically um, gifted. And there's one thing you have mentioned that you're really fortunate and happy that you have a wonderful career. Now, I would like to request if you can share, you know, one word or a direction to us parents. Often we find that we want to follow the typical growth, you know, go to kindergarten, go to primary, go to high school, go to university get a job, get married, all that. But our children, most of our children with autism don't really f seem to fit there. What can you tell well, us? The, the thing, you have uneven skills. I'm a, I'm a big believer in getting children exposed to lots of different things. I, I did all kinds of things when I was a child. Cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, music. Um, I was uh, taught musical instruments, and I was terrible at musical instruments, but good at art and mechanical things. And so you expose kids to lots of different things, then you can see what they are good at. But I know, uh, like you look at this equipment here, I've worked with people where a single welding class led to building things like what's shown in that picture. And then another kid, it might be mathematics and programming. Some you have to expose them. And then you've got people with autism that are not going to be building equipment, they're not going to be doing mathematics and programming. Um, let's say you have a kid that's good with numbers. Well, then show him, show him all the mathematical stuff. Here's some really cool pattern stuff right here. I found in one of my science magazines with those patterns. They all have mathematics behind them. Isn't that cool? <laughs> in a science magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, there's some kids that are going to just, um, uh, they may be gifted in that. You see, this is the problem. You know, they're really good at one thing, sometimes really bad at something else. And the people that build the equipment, like you see there, complicated stuff, most of them could not do algebra. It's all pure visual thinking. But they're building stuff like that. Thank you. I, um, I had a chance to go on a corporate jet the other day. Um, the guy who took one welding class, he builds entire beef plants, and there, he just has them memorized in his head, a single welding class. He's building entire beef plants. Um, unfortunately, now, we're he's ready. Not, he's not autistic. He's not autistic. Yeah. But I did work with several other people uh, in metalworking that I'm pretty sure were autistic. We're out of time now, so we're just going to have one more question. I know that we would. One more question. Hello? Midnight or whatever, I'm going to go to bed. But I'm really glad that I was able to get up and talk to everybody. Yeah, it's a and I'm uh, free to give the videotape around to people. There's more slides in this deck. Uh, you can go ahead and give people the whole slide deck. Uh, it just wasn't time for tonight to show all the slides. Uh, hello, Dr. Grandin. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my question is, right now I'm working as a general practitioner, but when I was a teenager, I had a distant cousin who, at that time, uh, he was seven years old. He has symptoms of um, aggressive behavior and at times, but uh, most of the times he's a very quiet kid. He won't interact yeah. much and everything, but the aggressive behavior is the key point, like it's almost disruptive. And uh, later on, we diagnosed he has autism. But uh, how, old, how old was he when he was doing the destructive behavior? Uh, at seven years old. 
and uh, because of that his whole family also have a history of mental illness like other mental illness it's uh, stigmatizing it's so traumatizing for all of them especially the boy so how to like uh, deal with aggress autism children with aggressive well, I, behavior I aggressive behavior. The other thing you have to look at, what is bringing it on? Is there a problem with frustration with communication or with sensory overload? Uh, or communication. With, we've got to make sure he doesn't have a pain. If, if the child is not speaking, then you always have to make sure you do not have a hidden painful medical issue, like maybe an ear infection, urinary tract infection, acid reflux in their stomach, a toothache something that's hurting that they cannot tell you about. I think they, he had meningitis. He had meningitis. Um, I also have problems with things like getting aggressive when I was a child. It was worse when I got tired. I had a pretty good sense of when she needed to just say, I need to go to my room and I just calm down. Um, but for when I was seven, um, you know, I was fully verbal and there were consequences for aggression. No TV for one night. And then I threw a big tantrum. Mother would put me in my room and let me calm down for half an hour. And then she'd say, well, you, you know the rule. You can join the family now. But um, there'll be no television tonight. You know, and I understood consequences. But I think there's some individuals where they may not make the connection between the tantrum they had in school and no uh, television that night. I, see, this is the problem with got autism. You've got such a big range. Um, okay, I think that um, that was. And then you've got the autistic. You see, the people that I worked with that had the metal working shop and all the patents, designing equipment, they would have been more the Asperger type. They would have been no speech delay. You see, this is where then that Asperger type with no speech delay now has been merged in with the autism with speech delay. I had speech delays, so I was definitely not the Asperger type. And the people that I, that I worked with professionally in metal working work would have been the Asperger type. But they had social issues. I'll never forget one of the jobs. Um, I had to drag the guy out of the shop because before he got the picture of the plant engineer. <laughs> Um, we're out of time now. Thank you very much. Thank, th th thank, thank you, you for joining us. Yes. Thank you. And it's my honor to introduce Dr. Alec Sharma. Dr. Alex Sharma is the professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery at LTM Medical College and Hospital in Mumbai, India. He is also the director of Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute and KLS Institute of Anti-Aging, both in Navi, Mumbai. He is the president of the Stem Cell Society in India and vice president of the International Association of Neurorestoratology. He has published 172 scientific papers, authored 24 books, contributed chapters in 19 textbooks, and made over 200 scientific presentations. He is a world-renowned pioneer in the field of cellular therapy for neurological disorders, having treated more than 12,000 patients from 75 different countries. His landmark accomplishments include the publication of the world's first scientific paper on the role of cellular therapy in autism. He has revolutionized the management of neurodevelopmental disorders with his innovative combination of cellular and integrative therapies. For this, he has received several international and national awards, such as the Rose of Parsilisus Award from the EMA Oxford 200. 2016, the European Award for Best Practices, Brussels 2018, the Bharat Gaurav Award, London 2019, the Newton Universal Legendary Award, Boston 2022, 
the Sinophil Asia International Peace Award, Manila 2023, etc. Let's welcome Dr. Alak Sharma. This is truly amazing to be in Dubai, to be at this wonderful international conference for autism and neurodevelopmental disorders, but most important to be able to give a talk immediately after Temple Grandin. What an honor. <laughs> I had never thought in my life that you know, one day I'd be speaking after the legendary Temple Grandin. Temple, you're just so amazing. You're not you, your life, your thoughts, your work, your effort. It's not just an inspiration to people on the spectrum, to their families, but to all of us caretakers, researchers, and doctors in the field as well. Uh, so I'd like to begin by thank thanking Temple for the wonderful and amazing talk that she just gave. Uh, I'm going to speak on a new topic that's regenerative medicine in autism spectrum disorders. When I give a talk, I'd like to begin with this picture. This is a picture, this is a painting, a huge painting, the size of this entire wall, which I found in a hospital in Haolein, Taiwan. And when I, when I enter that hospital, I ask them, why is this picture here? They said, this is a picture of Lord Buddha going into the jungle to heal. And they said, the job of the physician is to reach out to people who are in suffering and heal them. So that's what we have to do, reach out and help those in need of healing. Now, if you look at the increasing prevalence of autism, it is actually unbelievable and incredible that the world has not taken notice of what's happening. You look and see in 2004, the incidence was one in 166. In 2023, it has become one in 36. At this rate, in the next two decades, every third child will be, ha will be on the autism spectrum. Okay, this is something we as medical professionals need to bring to the attention of society, of people, of governments, of administrators and rulers, that this is unprecedented. And that the facilities to take care of these children do not match up to the increasing incidence. There are about 70 million kids on the planet. That's 1% of the world's population. It's like a huge, a huge, huge percentage of people. So the current situation is that, you know, you have a child who has some symptoms, you know, the parents notice, you, you go to the doctor, therapist, get a diagnosis, and they say what you can do is therapy, you start the therapy and you're back to where you were. So what's new? What am I going to be talking in this talk that's different? First, the concept of neurodiversity. And this is what Temple spoke of, okay? That we have to see how people on the spectrum are diverse, that they are not less than, they are different, that they have uneven talents and skills. So the concept of neurodiversity, because now there are going to be so many people on the planet that you can't look at them uh, in, in the way that we've been looking at them earlier. The other exciting thing, and I'm going to highlight that, is a better understanding of what's happening with the brain. And this is what has changed everything. Then the whole concept of neuronal regeneration, that it is possible to regenerate the brain that's not functioning as well. And the concept of multidisciplinary management, and of course, the main uh, base of my talk, which is cellular therapy. Now, what is new is that for the first time in medical history, we are now understanding which parts of the brain are functioning differently from neurotypical brains. And we've done scans, we've done a lot of research in this area, and you can see that list, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the parahippocampal gyrus, the cerebellum, the caudate nucleus, the mesial temporal lobes, thalamus, superior and middle temporal poles. So we've actually identified very clearly which parts of the brain are functioning less. We've also identified which parts of the brain are functioning more. Our focus so far has been on what these children can't do. What we also need to look at, which parts of their brain actually are functioning more than what neurotypical people do. And there are actually parts in the calcarine fissure, the Heschel's gyrus, cortical frontal areas that function more. They are hypermetabolic. So we need to understand this as well. And our work has been published in a landmark paper, among the first of it, it's in published literature in the World Journal of Nuclear Medicine, 
where we've clearly highlighted which parts of the brain work less and which are working more. Now, what we found here, and this is the only thing that we need to give attention to, because Temple again keeps talking of early intervention. She keeps talking about early intervention, and I'm going to show you the scientific base of the need for early intervention. And that is this, if you look at this graphic, you, you will see that, uh, you know, you will see that the brain metabolism over the years keeps on declining. So what you see in light green is how the brains of neurotypical kids, the brain metabolism keeps on increasing. Whereas children on the spectrum is the light blue, you can see it keeps on declining. What does this mean? It means the earlier we treat the children, the early intervention is there, the better results. Because the later you treat them, the hypermetabolism is actually increased. So the old thinking was that once the brain is damaged, you cannot regenerate it. And the new thinking is it's possible to regenerate the brain through cellular replacement and repair. The other thing that has changed in autism is the concept of multidisciplinary management. You know, so far what would happen is a person specializes in something and then that's all they would offer. So if, you're, if you do, you know, you're a center that has occupational therapy, you focus on occupational therapy, you have a center that does speech therapy, you focus on that, but what is the need is a multidisciplinary management, which includes everything, all the things listed, and cell therapy, which I will talk about, is one of them. So there is no one silver bullet. The management of autism will be multidisciplinary. So look at that. On the left-hand side, you see a fractured bone, and I ask yourself, will you give rehabilitation to a person with that fractured bone? Would anybody give physiotherapy on a broken bone? Now look at the left. You go to an orthopedic surgeon, you get it fixed, don't you? And now you give rehabilitation. But in autism, we do exactly the opposite. On the left-hand side, the blue area is the hypermetabolic brain. We are giving rehabilitation on a brain that's not functioning optimally, and then we are expecting results of a normal brain. It won't happen. But through cellular therapy, you can see on the right-hand side, the brain has started functioning again. Now, if you give rehabilitation, you are bound to get better results. So cell therapy is a promising new modality where you use healthy cells to replace damaged cells. So that's the damage, and you can see that there is recovery. So now look and see what are stem cells. So the word stem comes from the stem of a plant, and just like from the stem of a plant, you can have leaves, fruits, uh, everything else. There are some cells from which all the other cells arise. So the way stem cells work is they multiply, they convert into other cell types, they improve the blood supply, and they release certain positive growth chemicals. And because of that, they repair, they regenerate, and they replace damaged tissue. Cells are of two types. You can be autologous when you take from the patient, put it back in the patient, or donor cells when you take it from somebody else. There are different types of cells. You can get them from the embryo, but this is very controversial, so we do not use it. You can get them from the umbilical cord, you can get it from the patient itself, from the bone, and that's what we use. They are called adult stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells are in the research stage. So we work with adult stem cells because they are safe, they, they don't form tumors, they have no rejection, they are easily obtainable, and there are no ethical issues. There are different ways of injecting stem cells. You can inject it intrathecally into the spinal fluid, that's what we do, or intravenously, intramuscularly, through the nose or directly into the brain. How does cellular therapy work? We know the main problem in autism is there is hyperperfusion, decreased oxygenation and problems with the immune system and inflammation. Cell therapy works through both these mechanisms. So here is a small video showing the three basic steps, what we do. We do a bone marrow aspiration with a needle, separate the cells and inject it back. The whole process has only two needle pricks. Let's look at a video. There you can see with the needle we are aspirating bone marrow. That takes 15, 20 minutes. The bone marrow is put into machines. Uh, it separates the cells. And once the cells are ready, with a very thin needle, we inject it back. Just two needle pricks. And we take cells from the child and put it back into the child. So let's review what the world literature says. So there are a total of 33 clinical studies, published papers, which show a 80% success rate. 33 worldwide papers. And if you see a review of literature, the world's first scientific paper was published from India. It was by us. We also published the sixth one. The others came from China, Italy, uh, America, etc. 
So this is the world's first paper on cell therapy in autism, which we published in 2014. Uh, this was our paper, and it showed 91% uh, of the patients improved. The second paper came from China. Here again, they showed an 88% improvement. The third paper came from the United States by Dawson, again showing 90% improvement. This another paper from the United States by Kimberly et al. showing 90% success rate. This paper by Martinez from Mexico showing a 95% success rate. This paper from Vietnam by Tang et al. which showed a 93% success rate. This paper from Italy which showed a 78% success rate. Now this is a meta-analysis. This is a review of 460 patients. And at the end in this paper, they summarized that cellular therapy is safe and that it improves patients with autism spectrum regardless of what type of cell we use. In this other systemic review by uh, Jing Yang Q from China, they looked at 325 patients. And again, they said it is safe and effective. So there is enough published worldwide literature to show the effectiveness of cellular therapy. Now, this is our latest paper. We had two papers, but I'll, I'll talk about the second paper because this was 254 patients. We use autologous bone marrow mononuclear cells. You can see the improvement in the various symptoms and almost all the symptoms, <coughs> whether it's social interaction, <coughs> eye contact, attention, stereotypical behavior, aggressiveness, hyperactivity, self-injurious behavior, um, sitting tolerance, command following, speech, communication, all these you can see above is the percentage uh, of improvement. And we have scales called ISA and CARS. And you can see that there was a significant improvement, 94% and 95% in these scales. Now here's something interesting. The results depended on age. So those kids who are less than five years, we had a 97% success rate. Between 5 to 10, it reduced to 94. Between 10 to 15, 9, 94 again. And 15 and above, it was 91. So the earlier we intervene, the better results we are likely to get. Here again, you can see on SCARS scale, again, 98, 95, 90, 91. So you can see that age affects the outcome. Now, what was the objective proof? Because one is clinical improvement. So uh, in our study, we actually showed objective improvement. So above, this is a PET CT scan where the blue areas are the hypometabolic areas, the areas that are functioning less than normal. So you can see above all the blue. Now this is done on a Siemens machine. Below, you see six months later, and you can see the hypometabolic areas are gone. So this is objective proof. I'm just showing you one or two scans, but we have almost 3,000 such scans before and after that show that the brain damage, the parts of the brain that are not functioning appropriately in autism, they can be repaired. And this is proof of that. So this is on a Siemens machine, and <coughs> this is on a GE machine. Again, you can see the cerebellum, blue area, hypometabolic, and below you can see that it has improved. So on two different sets of machines, Siemens machine and General Electric machines both show before and after improvement. We have a total of six scientific publications in the results of cell therapy in autism. And now international books, medical books are introducing chapters. So in this book on recent advances in autism, there is a chapter, Stem Cell Therapy in Autism Spectrum Disorders, and they've asked us to write the chapter. So we've written the chapter for this book. Now this is data, this, the, what I showed you earlier was published. This, this, this data of 1,000 patients has been sent for publication. But just to give you uh, an outcome, this is 1,010 patients. And again, you can see more or less similar symptomatic improvements. Again, the ISA and CAR scales, good improvement. Uh, individual domains of ISA. And uh, age-wise, again, you can see the same thing. Below five years, 89% improvement. Uh, above 15 years, it dropped to 80%. And this is the analysis. You can see above the blue areas, the damage areas. And below, after cell therapy, you can see that the brain has got activated. You can again see above and below. So complications. So we've had no major complications. There has been no neurological deterioration, no infection. However, one major concern is that 3% of our patients uh, develop increased incidence of epilepsy when they already had epilepsy in the past. 10% of the patients get a spinal headache, which lasts for one or two days immediately after the procedure and there was some nausea, vomiting, local pain, et cetera. Now we've published this as a separate paper. 
People normally like to hide their adverse events. We've published a paper saying that seizures may happen as an adverse event because there is no treatment which does not have adverse events. But if you know it, you can actually manage it. So we've published this as well. Uh, now I'll just show you a couple of videos. Just uh, if you have little time, so yeah, we have some time. So I'll show you a couple of videos. There are three patients, three sets of patients from three continents. Uh, this is a child from America. <laughs> Father was a cardiologist, mother is a nurse, and he's improved so much. Today, this kid is not only completely off the spectrum, this, this video is a little old, but he's stopping in school and he's doing wonderfully well. I couldn't get him to engage with me. I couldn't give, get him to give me eye contact over time. He started to lose a lot of vocabulary. Right around 18 months to the age of two years, he just slid backwards. He would flap like that, and he would walk on his tiptoes, look at the wall and be talking to the wall. He had problems with eye contact. He'd never look you straight in the eye. He had problems with his speech. Some research and found out about neurogen. And the big question that I had in my own mind was, what is there to lose? And I could not come up with a good answer. And I said, we have to do it. started seeing better eye contact, definitely a difference in his engagement with us, with his sibling, his mood. He was so much calmer. Now he's all about taking his own shower. I have to just prompt him to get out, but he'll wash himself and he'll put his clothes on. It's all the PET scan images. We just, I can't tell you the word, we were just so excited and thrilled. The areas that were hypoactive or non-active were warm. They were, there was, there was activity there. Ganesh has gone from the third grade, fourth month reading level to a seventh grade, first month reading level in five months. And now we have, we have Mercy over here. We went to different doctors, we went to different hospitals, and when I brought it up, they were like, oh, no, 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 don't worry. It's because they are boys, they are triplets, they were premature. I would be walking out and I'm like, bye. And no child is crying, no child is waving back bye. And by then, for sure, I knew that they should be doing that. The children had this behavior of disappearing. In fact, Eric disappeared three times in the middle of the night. The biting, the spitting, the scratching. How are we going to stop this behavior? We went to see the neurologist, and in five minutes, he said, his children are autistic. As parents, it was very traumatizing. First of all, we didn't understand what autistic means. So I decided to really get to read a lot about autism. I remember the first time I read about stem cell. I was like, wow, this is really good. We had a lot of questions which we asked and we got very clear answers from Dr. Sharma. The day of the stem cell itself came Actually, I was a bit anxious, of course, but really I didn't have fear. A bit of apprehension, anxiety, of course, as a mother, but I knew they're in good hands. We put a needle in this pelvic bone, and then we take out the bone marrow, which is the fluid inside the bone. The pure stem cells, once they are ready, a thin needle is inserted into the lower back. We inject the stem cells into the cerebrospinal fluid. It flows all the way up to the brain. Things that would have taken probably years to be accomplished in my sons, in like eight months' time, we've really been able to come very far. Rinse with water. They used to defecate on their clothes, but now they can use the toilet. We've seen a lot of improvement in terms of spitting. The tantrums have reduced. Sleeping used to be a problem before, but at the moment, 
he is taken to his bed, he takes a few minutes and he is asleep. You see my son's cycle. You try to make them understand what it is to pedal and they couldn't. But after stem cell, when we arrived in Kenya the following day and we went out and these guys could cycle. send you to buy tomato paste, okay? I'm going to send you to buy what? Tomato paste. In the shop. Where is the shop? It's here. Okay. So I'm going to give you money. For what? To buy tomato lollipop. I'm going to buy my shoes. That's right. Parents ask me, so do you really think stem cell works? And I'm like... No! I can see changes. I can touch. I can feel. I can smell. Of course, for me, stem cell works. I'll do it until my children get well. So that's two stories, and uh, by the way, Ricky's right here. You're going to see him, he's right here. Uh, we are short of time, so I won't talk much about cerebral palsy, but this is a paper, it works just as well in cerebral palsy. We've got 15 articles, chapters, and textbooks, and uh, that's the brain damage before in cerebral palsy, that's after, you can see the improvement. Uh, then in intellectual disability, it works as well. We have the world's first scientific paper. We've treated more than 12,000 patients from 75 countries, total of 106 papers and 16 books. And uh, I'd just like to share the views of our Honorable Prime Minister. I went to Japan. So in Japan, I had one job in my work. I got a Nobel laureate there, a Nobel laureate scientist Yakamaha. I did this because they have researched the research in the stem cell. I had read so much, so I had come to my mind. इनकी एक खोज हमारे काम आ सकती है क्या है? हम गए तो वहाँ गए, उनसे चर्चा की और बेंगलोर के हमारे साइंस इंस्टीट्यूट के साथ आज उस दिशा में हमारा काम हो रहा है कि स्टेम सेल्स के द्वारा हमारे युवा साइंटिस्ट कुछ खोज करें। So that is the Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, talking in Parliament about stem cells, and here is the President of the United States. Today, with the executive order I am about to sign. We will bring the change that so many scientists and researchers, doctors and innovators, patients and loved ones have hoped for and fought for these past eight years. We will lift the ban on federal funding for promising embryonic stem cell research. <laughs> scientists believe these tiny cells may have the potential to help us understand and possibly cure some of our most devastating diseases and conditions to regenerate a severed spinal cord and lift someone from a wheelchair, to spur insulin production and spare a child from a lifetime of needles, to treat Parkinson's cancer, heart disease, and others that affect millions of Americans and the people who love them. There's no finish line in the work of science. The race is always with us. The urgent work of giving substance to hope and answering those many bedside prayers, of seeking a day when words like terminal and incurable are potentially retired from our vocabulary. So my conclusion is that adult stem cell therapy that we use may be considered a safe and effective treatment option for autism, cerebral palsy, and intellectual disability. It accelerates development, reduces disability, helps in functional recovery, and improves the quality of his life. We heard the, prime, the two biggest democracies in the world are India and America. You heard the Prime Minister of India speak of stem cells, you had the President of America speak about stem cells. But now I wanted to hear somebody more important than that. 
The child you saw in that video, he's right here, Ricky. Ricky, say a few words. <laughs> Talk to the audience. Thank you, thank you. Say something. Thank you, everyone. I, I like to say thank you for thank you for giving me the Nerogen stuff which we made. <laughs> this child could not speak. This child could not go to school. Today he's standing in front of you yeah. and giving a speech. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Come. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. It is really my privilege to introduce this next speaker. When Dali told me that I was going to be introducing him, I said, are you sure you want me to introduce him? Well, I'm here, so I guess she was sure. <laughs> Dr. Carrie Magrove is an award-winning autistic professional speaker, best-selling author, autism consultant to the HBO series, Mrs. Fletcher, that aired in the fall of 2019, and the latest seasons of Netflix's Emmy Award-winning series, Love on the Spectrum. If you haven't seen that, you really need to watch it. It is very, very good. He started professional, professionally speaking 12 years ago via the National Speakers Association after he fell in love with theater as a child to help with his social and communication skills. Today, he has spoken at over 1,200 events during the time, including two TED Talks and talks at Google presentations. In addition, Kerry is CEO and president of KFM Making a Difference, a nonprofit organization that hosts, hosts inclusion events and has provided 100 scholarships for students with autism for college and counting since 2011. In his spare time, which I'm not sure how he has, he hosts a Facebook page called Carrie's Autism Journey that now has 218,000 Facebook followers where he does on-camera interviews highlighting people impacted by a diagnosis to break down barriers in our community. His videos have, produced, have been produced and have been watched over 35 million times. Carrie's best-selling books, Defining Autism from the Heart, and autism and falling in love, I Will Light It Up Blue, and his latest, Autistics and Autism, have reached the Amazon bestseller list for special needs parenting. Carrie regularly speaks with schools, companies, government organizations, and is always open to discussing potential future collaborations. He is based in Hoboken, New Jersey. Let's give him a really big applause. He's got a video that's supposed to be starting. Not bad for a guy who was completely nonverbal for the first few years of his life. But once Kerry Magro found his voice, he had a lot to say. My parents have always told me I'm special, so why am I special? And then later on, I realized that I'm even more special because I have autism. Carrie Magro's childhood was marked with rough patches. He was completely nonverbal at age two and diagnosed with autism at age four. I just remember um, having difficulties trying to explain myself to the world around me. When Carrie did speak, he struggled to express himself. Most of my memories were simply just about that kid who wanted to communicate with the world around him, but didn't have the verbal means of actually doing that. His mother, Suzanne, remembers watching her son have a hard time adjusting to the outside world. He turned two and he was scared of everything. He was scared of the water, he was scared of the rain. But as the years went on, Kerry slowly began to find his words. When you can't communicate with the people you love the most in this world about even some of your basic needs, it gets really, really tough. So, but 
Luckily, <laughs> once I started talking, <laughs> I never stopped talking. Wow. This is a tough one today. Cindy Shu introduces us to an autistic man who's spreading awareness and understanding throughout the world. And his latest way of educating people about autism is by making TikTok videos. I received over 4.1 million views on TikTok, and I just had so many parents, educators, family members who just wanted to learn more about autism, and they were like, keep going, keep doing what you're doing because it's making a difference. In college, he started a nonprofit called KFM Making a Difference, which awards autistic students with college scholarships. He later earned his doctorate in education. He's now a professional speaker on autism and inclusion. We've gotten inquiries from people from Africa. Africa, Canada, the UK, and it, it's just shown me that we're not alone in this community. There are people impacted by autism across the globe. He's written four books. His latest one is called Autistics on Autism. All proceeds will go to a scholarship foundation. You are going to find 100 amazing autistic adults' stories of how they were able to navigate their adolescence and ultimately succeed in their journeys. He says most publicly funded services end for autistic children when they age out of school, so that could be late teens. He's fighting to get resources for autistic adults through legislation and has this message for parents. Never give up on your child. Never give up on getting them the best quality supports so they could live their best quality of lives because again it's a spectrum and it's really about providing those resources across the lifespan because autistic children will grow up to be autistic adults and we need to be ready for them. And he'll keep promoting awareness any way he can. What I'm doing today? Awesome. I, 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 it is such a huge honor to be here with all of you uh, speaking on a really important topic that is facing so many individuals within our community. And honestly, today, with over 70 million people worldwide having some form of autism diagnosis, it's really important that we do our utmost to do a few quick things. The first one is to realize that autism is just one word trying to describe millions of different stories. My dear friend Stuart Duncan has that comment, comment, and when you meet people with autism, it's really important to meet them where they are in their development. Autism is a very, very wide spectrum. The last time we were here in Dubai, ironically enough, was in 2016, and one of the speakers at that conference with me, his name is Dr. Stephen Shore, an internationally known public speaker who himself is autistic, says if you met one autistic person, you've met just that one autistic person. So let's keep the conversation going on meeting each individual where they are in their own development. So some housekeeping notes today. Uh, I'm an avid note taker during all these presentations. So typically I'm the guy sitting in the front row uh, taking a photo of every single slide so I don't miss anything. Uh, so we're gonna be providing you the PowerPoint slide notes from today's presentation. There will be a QR code at the end of today's presentation. You can scan that with your phone and and my dad still loves a Razer cell phone, so there will also be a link uh, if you don't have a smartphone as well, so you don't miss any of the notes. So during my journey, uh, I grew up with two laser-focused key interests. I grew up wanting to be uh, the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys, and I also wanted to grow up to be the next Larry Bird. Uh, and with my autism diagnosis, I've always had extreme laser-focused key interests, uh, and those were two of the big ones. Uh, sports helped helped me with a lot of my fine motor skills growing up with autism. In addition to having autism, I also have a dual diagnosis of dysgraphia. It's really important that when we meet individuals where they are in their own development, that we look for comorbidities. So if an individual might have a dual diagnosis, we are able to diagnose that as early as possible. Early intervention truly, truly is the key within those first five years, getting a diagnosis is really, really pivotal. So I took my love of sports to get a degree in sport management at St. Hall University, uh, where I'm based in New Jersey. Uh, before deciding to change career paths, I realized that there those with individuals with disabilities make up the largest minority in the United States, and often they are one of the most underserved, because simply put, some individuals in our community have 
strong support needs and might not be able to advocate for themselves. So it's really, really important that we do our utmost to try to help one of the most underserved communities in the world today. So I decided to change career paths. I received a uh, master's in strategic communication so I could become one of the first professionally certified speakers who is openly autistic in the United States. It's given me the opportunity to travel the globe in the past 12 years and get the opportunity to speak with so many incredible groups like your own about this topic of autism, but then also diversity, equity, and inclusion. One of our big, big focuses, especially in the past few years, has really been focused on corporate and really focused on helping those with autism find meaningful employment and tapping into one of the most untapped talent pools that employers should consider. So really quickly today, and again, this was a journey, uh, I want you to imagine something really quickly. Imagine not being able to tell your loved ones that you love them. Not being able to speak in full sentences until you were seven years old. Having sensory challenges to the point where you felt like an alien compared to other people. Being such a picky eater <laughs> that any time your parents tried to introduce you to a new food, it made you cringe. This used to be my life. When I was a kid, there were so many people who told me what I would never be able to do in this life. They would also tell me that I would have a photogenic memory, that I would be really, really great at math, and when I turned 21, my parents would take me to Las Vegas with them, and I would win them $88,000 on the blackjack tables. <laughs> Prototypically, this was, I was considered a Rain Man diagnosis. I was considered a savant, but I was also considered somebody who had a lot of limitations in his life. So what helped get me to where I am today speaking in front of all of you was uh, over 15 years of occupational speech and physical therapy, there's no one size fits all when it comes to our autism community. One of the first movies I ever got the opportunity to consult on was a movie from Warner Brothers called Joyful Noise, starring Queen Latifah and Dolly Parton based on one of the characters in that film having autism. And Queen Latifah's character has a great quote in that movie where she says, when things don't fit, in a nice, pretty box, you build a bigger box. And that's what we have to do for individuals in their autism community. And my mom, love her to death, she's here with me today, uh, had the opportunity to really create a bigger box for me, and that's why I'm uh, here today. I love you, mom. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. And now she's gonna be blushing for the next 30 minutes, so. I am so sorry for that. Uh, so, uh, but she found what worked for me. She found that occupational speech and physical were integral, uh, using my key interest of being the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys to find music and theater therapy as an integral way of helping me with my sensory processing challenges. Also including reward systems and token systems as a way of helping me build on my self-motivation, especially when I was initially diagnosed with uh, autism when I was four years old, and then also positive reinforcement practices. Telling our kids what they are good at at the beginning of each day can really help provide a positive mindset for them in their academics every single day, but also their lives as well. And then also self-advocacy. It's so important in our society that we teach our kids about their diagnoses at earlier ages, because I grew up knowing I was special, but not knowing what that meant. So for years in my life, it was just me going to specialized children's hospitals and finding services and seeing kids lining up blocks uh, and lining up their toys. And I was always like, these individuals are special just like me, but why am I special? And it was so life-changing to learn about my diagnosis. So my background today, um, I would say about 80% of our annual referrals are in uh, speaking with diversity, equity, inclusion groups, uh, employee resource groups, about tapping into this untapped talent pool. Some of the things that you should know is that those with autism, on average, are more likely to stay at a job longer. They are more likely to take less time off from work. And when we talk about the majority of reasonable accommodations, I speak to so many companies, even globally, who say, well, Carrie, I'm not sure if I could actually hire somebody who's on the autism spectrum because I think it's going to affect the bottom line. And a lot of people don't know this, the, me the majority of reasonable accommodations cost absolutely nothing, and when they do, it's typically just an onboarding fee of around $500 to $1,000. So let's 
start changing the conversation. I took my love of theater uh, when I graduated from college to really just get involved with the entertainment industry. I got to meet a wonderful man named Todd Graff who uh, was directing this movie called Joyful Noise. And I told him about how theater had an impact on me growing up on the autism spectrum. And he was like, Carrie, would you like to be a consultant on this film? I didn't actually know this was a job that people could get paid for. And I thought I was getting punked at the time. Uh, and I thought it was just like a practical joke that my parents kind of like threw at me from like a family friend. Uh, but within just a few days, uh, I was working on this Hollywood film with one of the characters having autism. And we've now got an opportunity to work on a wide range of films and TV shows today that focus on autism related characters because representation truly, truly matters within our our community and seeing more individuals with disabilities on the screen today. I took my love of trying to support the disability community to start a 501c3 nonprofit organization called KFM Making a Difference, where we provide not only peer mentoring for individuals with developmental disabilities from the ages of 16 to 24, but we also have provided 130 scholarships for autistic students to pursue a post-secondary education in the past nine years. And 100% of our, 100%, uh, 100%, 100 of our scholarship applicants uh, actually uh, wrote a chapter for our book, Autistics on Autism, where 100% of the proceeds from this book that came out last year go directly back to support our nonprofit organization. So along the way, uh, one of my mentees, when I was just starting off my nonprofit, said to me, Carrie, how do I learn more about the autism community from people who are actually impacted by autism? And I didn't have any resources to share with him, really. So I thought to myself, why not write a book? Uh, I assumed it would sell 50 copies and be a good Christmas gift for my parents. Uh, when my first book, Defining Autism from the Heart, came out, focused on self-advocacy. But within three days, it became an Amazon bestseller for special need parenting. And it continued to give us a platform to discuss autism within our communities, writing books about autism and relationships, college for uh, students with disabilities, in addition to how we look at this life after lockdown, after COVID-19, how we could support individuals with developmental disabilities. And one of the most fun things I get to do as part of my job is I get to meet local self-advocates and I get the opportunity to nurture their, their self-advocacy. Uh, we got to meet this incredible family uh, that I wanted to highlight with all of you today because it's a unique message that I hope more people in our community can really relate to. So we're going to play this video and fingers crossed tech works. Yeah. You have two sisters, Rachel. Both sisters. Both sisters. JJ, what do you like to do for fun? His personality is amazing. He's just, he's so funny. He doesn't even know it. Like, he doesn't know how funny he is, which makes it better. Um, I love how JJ makes these movies and he uses the stuff that I want and he shows us to all of us. And I think it's really cool. What is one of your favorite things about your sister? Mm -hmm. So one of the key messages I hope I could leave you with today is that it takes a village and you have to realize that regardless of where you are in this journey, whether you're an educator here today, a therapist, a parent, or a self-advocate, 
it's important to know that every single individual in your lives can hopefully become part of this village to make sure that we're providing reliable autism resources across the lifespan for our over 70 million individuals who are autistic today. So every single place I go to speak, I've had the opportunity to travel the globe and get the opportunity to share my story, but I realized that many individuals in our local communities didn't have an opportunity to share and lift their voices. So I started a video series as part of my Facebook page, Carrie's Autism Journey, where we now get to not only nurture self-advocacy in these young individuals, but also give them a platform to hopefully break down barriers and biases within our community. We've highlighted Everyone from a, a six-month-old with Down syndrome in the Bahamas all the way to an Army veteran with cerebral palsy who didn't tell uh, his platoon that he had cerebral palsy so he could fight for our country. So it was truly, truly remarkable. The other big note uh, I hope I can leave you with today is that Girls with disabilities often fall through the cracks in our society. We see this so much with so many girls being able to being able to bear mask, different characteristics such as stimming, such as known as self-stimulatory behavior. There are some individuals who fall through the cracks because of that. We're gonna skip this video and maybe come back for it if we have a little bit of time. But what I will tell you about Rachel's story is that Rachel is a truly amazing individual who didn't get diagnosed until she was a little bit older. And and it was because of, again, some, so much stigma in our communities is focused on boys with disabilities. Now, we're not only talking about autism, but we're talking about ADD, ADHD, and the neurodiverse lens that we talk about in our communities. In addition to that, when we talk about this topic of autism, we need more not only government organizations, but we also need more travel destinations to go about certification. I've had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with a group uh, called IBCCES, who do certified autism centers around the country. We just spent uh, yesterday at Aqua Venture uh, at Atlantis, and they are a certified autism center. We got to see sensory guides that they had uh, for different rides, which told you how much sensory processing each ride specifically had. And it was just so amazing to see the structure there, especially to bring families of autistic children to our parks. It was truly an amazing thing to see. In addition to that, when we talk about uh, this, it's also just great to reduce stigmas. One of the great things about certified autism centers is that they train up to 80% of their employees on autism and sensory awareness in the hopes of helping these individuals understand a little bit more about how to approach our community. Uh, so how I got involved in making the world more inclusive, uh, my interest in cert certif certification started with wanting to host more sensory friendly uh, meetings in my home state of New Jersey. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've played an autism and sensory friendly Santa Claus, uh, where we had the opportunity to meet children with disabilities at their level uh, to really truly support them, especially from a sensory processing perspective. So I decided to join a board called IBCCS based in Jacksonville, Florida in 2019 to support this community. So during my uh, work in public speaking, one of the most interesting experiences I had was when I was speaking at a Fortune 500 company and we were speaking about diversity, equity, inclusion and one of the individuals in there asked me if every single person who has autism grows up to be the good doctor. If anyone has seen The Good Doctor, The Good Doctor is a show on ABC focused on Dr. Sean Murphy, a savant who is on the autism spectrum. And that's why we need to make sure people realize that autism is not only in children, but there are gonna be individuals in our workplaces that you meet in the future who are also going to have these diagnoses. And not every single person you meet will end up fitting in this lens of the Rain Man Good Doctor stereotype. So that's the other big thing. We have to realize that autism has no look. Typically, the two most common things people say to me when they come up to me for the first time is they say, Carrie, you have autism, but you don't look like you have autism. And then also, Carrie, you have autism, but you look so normal. It, disability has no look. And it's important that we not only discuss this, because it's also important about promoting kindness. When we talk about our society, there are going to be people that you meet who you're only going to see 
the challenges that may face on the surface. You're not going to know what's going on in day-to-day -day lives. So one of my biggest challenges, though, was sensory related. Uh, I grew up being having a hypersensitivity when it came to loud noises. I would wear earbuds in my ears. I would wear sunglasses in many of my classrooms due to fluorescent lights. So luckily, though, I had a, a not only a great occupational therapy team, but I also had an in-house occupational therapist who truly, truly helped me. And this is a global movement that we're seeing. There are more groups that want to go about certifications because they, they realize that it's not only the right thing to do, but it also demonstrates high ROI because at the end of the day, more individuals are likely to buy products from groups that patronize with the disability community and support those with disabilities. We were so excited to see that Mesa, Arizona became one of the first autism certified cities in the globe. And they have done a, tr a remarkable gr work, not only to provide certified autism centers for first responder groups, but also their businesses and travel destinations as well. And in addition to that, Dubai uh, recently announced uh, it plans to become the first certified autism destination in the Eastern Hemisphere. Give your guys selves a round of applause. That's really, <laughs> truly, truly remarkable. And we need more individuals like yourselves championing this cause. So we applaud Dubai for taking the necessary steps to make certifications like this possible, realizing the importance of the autism community. Uh, one of my favorite experiences uh, I've ever had uh, was at a certified autism center. I, a after growing up as somebody who struggled with textural issues and having issues with water on my skin, there was always something soothing about uh, playing with animals in the water. So I got to go to the Discovery Cove in Florida, which was at a certified autism center, and we got the opportunity to swim with dolphins. And I have terrible balance issues. I can't ride a bike for the life of me. Uh, and in the water that day, I was having some challenges because the actual, the land was very, very tough. On my, I also had flat feet, so that didn't help the situation. So I, I was at Discovery Cove, and one of the best things that somebody did for me there was just showing me compassion. They not only showed me compassion in being able to just hold my hand while I was going in the water to swim with the dolphins, but they asked questions when they were unsure about something. I think some of the easiest things that can help our autism community are some of the things that just make the most common sense in the world. Continue to ask questions when you're uncertain about something, and then also presuming competence. They presumed competence for me every single minute that I was there at that park. And that's truly why I love the idea of certifications in our local community. In addition to that, other things to consider, autism and the majority of disabilities are life long. While early intervention is the key, those first five years are pivotal, we need to realize that people don't cure themselves of having autism. We spoke at, uh, in uh, Egypt a few years ago when we were laying the pyramids of Giza blue, and I was just talking to somebody about this earlier, and one of the, one of the parents would ask me if exorcisms could cure autism. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's an interesting perspective I haven't heard from before. Uh, it just goes to show that the education truly needs to be there in more of our local communities. Because if you don't have that personal connection, and just by a show of hands really quickly today, how many of you uh, know of somebody who's on the autism spectrum? And if you feel comfortable, how many of you have a sibling or a family member who's on the autism spectrum? Okay. And if you feel comfortable enough, how many self-advocates are here today? Yeah, we have quite a few. It takes a village, and using your voice can truly make such an important, important change within our community. Another key message I hope I can leave you with today, if it isn't written down, it did not not happen. Documentation is so, so important, especially when we look in 2023. Hearsay is something we really can't get behind anymore. We need to make sure that we're not only documenting in our workplaces, but also for our kids. I think it's important for every therapist and educator to have a journal where they can document for their child, look at short and long-term goals that they have for the individuals, and but also helping the parents understand about their developmental milestones as well. And I truly believe this message right here. I think schools should truly have a mandatory class 
that you get credit for, where you learn more about people with diagnoses. Imagine students getting just a little education on autism, ADHD, Down syndrome, dyslexia, cerebral palsy. It could make a huge impact on understanding and acceptance. I truly believe that in that message. And that's why many individuals in our local communities are pivoting our conversations. April is also known to many of us as Autism Awareness Month, but many individuals in our community are pivoting it to Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, realizing that it's not enough to just be aware about autism, but how can we be inclusive? So these are some great ways that we can be inclusive in our education setting today. One of the biggest things I say is that finding an individual and understanding what type of learner they are, whether they're a visual learner, whether they're an auditory learner, or whether they're a kinetic learner, where they learn by movement and moving around. Being able to, again, meet every single individual where they are. Being concise, giving choices, also considering visual timers as a way of helping individuals with transitions. Educate on stimming and flapping. For example, I've been stimming this entire time. Every single time I've moved my hand like this, this is a stem. And for everyone here in this room, every single one of you stem. Whenever you've rocked back and forth in a chair during a long meeting, that's a stem. Stimming and flapping can look vastly different. Some are going to be arm movements, twirling around in circles, while some of it is just like me, just rubbing my hands and doing this every now and then. And for so many individuals, if you see that happening, don't stop the STEM, especially if it's not injurious to them or people in their local community. Uh, also, in addition to that, in our school systems, we really need to focus on the parent-teacher collaboration. But in addition to that, we also need to realize that mental health is a true, true priority. We need to defeat stigmas that see autism as a mental health disorder, but we do need to realize that some people with autism have mental health-related challenges and comorbidities. So connecting on people with, on a personal level, but also researching social emotional learning as well can be really beneficial. Also, in addition to that, consider lesson plans in your schools focused on giving individuals positive peer role models to look up to. We get the opportunity to speak in a wide range of K through 12 schools where we get the opportunity to discuss, for example, individuals like Michael Jordan has ADD, Magic Johnson has attention deficit disorder, and my favorite on this list, Dan Aykroyd. Uh, Dan Aykroyd grew up with two laser-focused key interests. He grew up wanting to be uh, a ghost hunter, and he grew up wanting to become a crime detective, and he took those two key passions to co-write a movie in the 1980s called, does anyone know what the movie is? <laughs> Okay, sorry, karaoke with us later. We'll be outside during the lunch break. Uh, but it's so true. And years later, he would sit down with a reporter and he would say that it was because of his autism diagnosis was the reason that he was able to come out with that script. So when we look at some people with disabilities, realize that some people with disabilities are truly capable of amazing things. In addition to that, it's important to rule out as many associated and mental health conditions as humanly possible as well. And that was something my parents did for me. Uh, learning about my diagnosis, I didn't learn about my diagnosis until I was in a social skills class where we were playing disability celebrity bingo, where we were learning about all these individuals. And I raised my hand and I asked the teacher, so teacher, you said all these people, some of the most talented and successful people in the globe are special, just like me. So why am I special? And she said, I had to talk to my parents about that. So I talked to my parents about it right after school that day, and that was the first time they ever told me that I had autism. And it was life-changing. For so many years of not knowing why I was special, everything came full circle for the first time. And I started understanding why I, did, I was stimming, why I was wearing sunglasses in many of my classrooms, and everything just came to perfect sense for me. So it's important when we talk about this to have earlier conversations so when our children are in school, they can understand a little bit more about the accommodations that they may receive. Also consider having a dialogue with parents that you may know about the importance of a child's diagnosis as well. So in addition to that, what helped me is we need to emphasize that the key is communication, not speech. There's gonna be individuals in our community, 
specifically where I'm based in the United States, 40% of all autistic people are either non-speaking or non-verbal. But one of the stigmas we have is that a lot of people think that they are unintelligent and have a low IQ. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Most people on average, especially in the United States who are nonverbal, have an average to above average IQ. So we need to realize that also the key is communication, not speech. But just because somebody's nonverbal does not necessarily mean that they're unintelligent. There's some great global tools that you can use to understand how individuals in your communities communicate, such as the communication matrix. Uh, this is a free benchmarking tool that helps assess how individuals communicate within our local communities from things like pre-attentional behavior, intentional behavior, and then also unconventional, and also helping you understand the differences between nonverbal and non-speaking because there's a lot of stigmas around that. Nonverbal literally means no noises at all, no babbling at a certain amount of months a kid is growing up. Non-speaking could be something completely opposite of that. In addition to that importance of peer mentoring, uh, I truly believe that every school system in our, around the globe should have a strong peer mentoring program because it just makes sense. It doesn't affect the bottom line in our schools. Typically, it just takes an academic advisor 20 to 25 hours every academic year to put into place to give kids positive peer role models. And not only has been shown to lead to decreases in depression, anxiety, but it also helps from a bullying prevention perspective as well. Uh, and then social connections can lead to academic success. We need to educate our schools about the importance of providing more elective opportunities, but also more unified uh, classrooms as well, helping individuals with and without disabilities be able to interact, not only to become more inclusive overall, but to help them have those social connections because a little awareness can truly go a long way. Uh, and then also considering educating uh, around universal design for learning. Uh, lecture style is truly, truly dying in many of our communities. So the importance of getting individuals out of their seat and engaging with them is really, really important. Hey, Mama Max, how am I doing on time? Uh, Nice, nice. See, I put her to work. I put her to work, guys. Uh, encouraging uh, parent involvement can also be, and she'll be blushing for the next 12 minutes, too. It's amazing. I love you. I love you, Bob. I love you. Uh, encouraging parent involvement uh, is really uh, key as well. Uh, I did my dissertation. I got my doctorate in education at New Jersey State University, so I could become an adjunct professor while I continue my full-time job uh, public speaking. And I did a qualitative study focused on the perception of resources for parents of children with autism who are in online communities. And what we learned from these semi-structured interviews was the importance of trying to find a village, especially for those who have multiple jobs, for military families who might be traveling a lot, being able to find your village online. And seeing that a lot of parents have found success using Facebook groups and other methods of technology as a way of helping them communicate, especially around referrals towards different therapies and supports in their local areas. Also consider in your schools having alumni organizations comprising of individuals with disabilities to educate the school districts about the disability community and what helped them when they were in school. Again, something that doesn't affect the bottom line and it just makes a lot of sense. In addition to that, creating home safety zones, one of the things that we've loved about the certified autism centers we've seen here in Dubai is that each one of them has a quiet zone or a quiet space. And that just helps so many of us, regardless if somebody has autism and has social and communication challenges or sensory related challenges. All of us could use a quiet space every now and then. I know I could. Uh, and then also uh, considering how we look at visuals, especially for non-speaking individuals, I definitely recommend, especially in local parks that you know, considering advocating with your local governments to look at instituting communication boards as a way of helping individuals who are non-speaking communicate with those who are verbal. Uh, PEX boards, also known as picture exchange communication systems, are something that has truly been uh, very, very helpful for many individuals within our autism community. In addition to that, we need more inclusive events in our classrooms. And I wanted to share a quick video with all of you so you could get a little sense of one of the things that we're doing to try to be more inclusive for the world. Sarah Callagy had a one-of-a-kind meeting with Santa. The eight-year-old has autism. 
autism and is nonverbal. Her father brought her to this event because this is Santa's helper understands the challenges of autism firsthand. Santa also has autism. <laughs> so it's a special connection, special bond. The helper is actually 28-year-old Carrie Madrow. Diagnosed at four, his sensory challenges prevented him from visiting Santa as a child. He created this event so others like him don't miss out. This event is more inclusive because we dim the lights, we, we turn down the sound and try to help them as much as we can. Just a great job. It just takes his time. There's no rush. Most of the elves and Mrs. Claus are occupational therapists and special education teachers. The team visited with 181 special needs families, including four-year-old Rusty Marsh. Is this the first time you've seen Santa? Yes. Is it? Yes. And was he a nice Santa? Yes. With one in 68 children diagnosed with autism, Magro hopes to inspire more sensory-friendly events all year round. Autism doesn't stop in December. It doesn't stop during Christmas. I want everyone to be happy. Santa says, this is the best Christmas gift of all. This is the third year of the event, and Magnus' mom is one of those jolly elves. So uh, the girl in the last uh, s slide that said, I, I want everybody to be happy, we're actually working on a children's book together right now that uh, it's going to be focused on uh, autism and sensory friendly Santa, where uh, I, I believe most of the proceeds will go back to our, our scholarship uh, program as well. So it's just important overall when we talk about these sensory friendly inclusion events. It, again, it just makes sense. It gets more people out to our public areas. It also can help build attendance, especially after COVID-19 with COVID-19 hesitancy in some of our areas. If you want to learn more about how you can create a sensory friendly in inclusive event, I would definitely recommend going to this website called paautism.org. On their website, they have a one sheet PDF where you could learn a little bit more about the sensory considerations you could put into place to make this a reality in your local area, such as being able to turn down bright lights, turn down external noises, and the other sensory considerations as well. Also realize that bullying is such a huge epidemic uh, across the globe. When we were here in 2016 speaking at the Autism Around the World Conference, we got to work with the Dubai Autism Center. And one of the key messages that we left with them was that bullying is something that's not only in school-age children, we see a lot of bullying in the workplaces today as well. So we have to realize that this could be a lasting challenge for many in our community. I didn't have the social abilities to defend myself in many cases as somebody who didn't start speaking complete sentences until I was seven. And it's really, really important that we educate our kids on the what a friend is, what a bully is, and how to go about stopping bullying, especially for our verbal students. When stopping bullying like happened for me completely, I realized what bullies did. So I would role play different scenarios in my classrooms with my teachers on how to stop a bullying, where if somebody said to me, Carrie, you have autism, but you are so stupid, I would turn around and I'd be like, well, yeah, um, you know, sometimes I do stupid things. Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. And that literally would stop the bully from actually, because when you don't give them the power over you, we have to realize that bullying simply is just that, an imbalance of power. And when somebody want, that bully wants the power over somebody else, being able to tell the bully that regardless of what you say, you could hate my guts, I'm still gonna love you anyway, it completely stops that situation from happening. So let's continue those conversations. October is also National Bullying Prevention Month, so it has a global perspective on discussing the importance of pivoting from autism awareness to autism acceptance. There's also going to be individuals in your community who would prefer to be called an autistic individual versus a person with autism. That's really, really important to understand. There's some individuals, especially in our autism and deaf communities, who find validation uh, in their diagnoses. So in addition to that, when you look at things like low functioning and high functioning, it's really, really important to understand that I could speak in front of a room of 300 people like today and be considered quote unquote high functioning, but people don't see the struggles that 
I'm probably going to have to deal with tomorrow, recharging my batteries because of being able to speak, hearing the speakers and the loud noises going on. And during that time, I would not be considered, quote unquote, high functioning. So when you think about this, consider support needs, those who might have high support needs versus low support needs. And like so many of our speakers have already mentioned, just calling the individual by their name and explaining a little bit more about their strengths and associated challenges. So finally, the 10 things that really helped me get to where I am today speaking in front of all of you. The first thing is that we need to make sure that we're providing positive peer role models, that we're focused on the transition period as well. Our autistic kids will become autistic adults and we need to be ready for them. I've given two TED Talks that are available to check out on YouTube focused on adult autism where we discuss this in more detail. Uh, role playing, it just helps everyone. It helps build a structure, not only in terms of mock interviews, dating scenarios, but also helping build on social skills as well. Uh, servant leadership, I had so much mind blindness growing up and I thought it was my way or the highway most of the time. And I didn't understand the perspectives of others. And getting involved in community service helped open my eyes to some of the hardships that individuals face in their communities. I think that our students should have just 10 hours of community service every academic year to understand more about the perspectives of others in their community. Learning from other self-advocates, you obviously got to hear from Dr. Temple Grandin. She is phenomenal this morning. Uh, but continuing to promote self-advocates to give individuals an opportunity to look up to somebody. Peer mentoring, it just makes sense. Every school should have them. Uh, before COVID-19, we were giving staff development for 350 educators in Las Vegas. And we asked them, how many of you have a strong peer mentoring program in your school? And only three out of the 350 raised their hands. And I was stunned. This doesn't affect the bottom line, and it's just the right thing to do. Uh, like Queen Latifah's character says, create a bigger box. So when it comes to therapy, you have to meet each individual where they are. But I've seen positive benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy as a way of helping individuals go towards positive thoughts who might have negative thoughts and challenging behaviors. Uh, Self-reflection, I think, again, documentation is key for all the educators in the room. But in addition to that, it just helps build on self-awareness for individuals, especially those who are just learning about their diagnosis. Physical activity, as we more, learn more about the brain, we're also real, realizing that just 30 minutes of walking a day has benefits on short-term and long-term retention while also helping with positive endorphins. Also finding support networks, ICANN is a tremendous, tremendous resource. I hope all of you go to their website after this presentation today and really gain the resources, get their ebook because they're truly making a difference. And then also writing a blog because your voice has true, true power within our community. And it's upon all of us. If I could leave you with any final message is I hope you can be brave. I grew up being the kid who never wanted to tell anybody about my autism diagnosis because I was worried how everybody would feel when they heard that I had autism for the first time. And now today I go into the companies and they say to me, uh, Carrie, I, I want to do professional development on autism and I want to have you speak in my conferences, but I don't, I'm not brave enough to kind of talk about autism because it's such a sensitive topic. And with the numbers continuing to increase, not only where I'm from in the US where it's one in 36, but globally, I want every single one of you in this room to be brave because it's about our community and it's about supporting these individuals across the lifespan. So I like to say that autism can't define me and I define autism and I can only hope that regardless of any single journey that any of you have in this life, that you can go out there and you can define your lives and your journeys in the way that you best see it every single day. And if you need any help getting started in these conversations, please stay in touch. Thank you all so much for having me here today. Yeah, so just one um, small announcement that we have. We would really love to felicitate uh, Carrie's mother. And we would like to call upon uh, Miss Mercy, as she's as well a parent, and uh, hand over the award to Carrie's mother. Ma'am, please.
Now, it's a true honor to call Dr. Nadia Al Saig on stage. She's our chief guest. Please, all of you all, a big round of applause for ma'am. She's the founder and director general of Census Residential and Daycare for Special Needs. We would really like to fel felicitate ma'am as Census has been the strategic partner for ICANN. Next, we would uh, Social media. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we just do a bit of her. Next, we would like to felicitate MENA organization as well, as they as well are the strategic partners for ICANN. A big round of applause. Thank you so much. And now we would like to fel felicitate Farhan Shahid, who is from Census and uh, has been helping us with the entire organization of ICANN. So thanks to one and all for helping us putting this show up. OK, now I would like to invite Dr. Nadia to say a few words. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala khair al-anam Muhammad al-Mustafa wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Good morning, everyone, and I would like to welcome the International Conference for Autism and New Developmental Disorder, ICANN Dubai 2023. It's a great honor to be a part of this event and hope we, came, we come down with this conference with the best practice to the region and share knowledge to the latest trends on autism and new, uh, new uh, developmental disorder. And really, I would like to, have, uh, to take the opportunity to thank you all, thank the speakers and the partners of this conference, and especially the audience for your particip participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we will be inaugurating our book, Treatments for Autism. Um, as we did see in the film, it was earlier already inaugurated in English, but now we are inaugurating it in Arabic language. So ma'am would do the honors.
give you a brief about this book. This book has all the therapies, treatments, all the information about autism and all kinds of newer age treatments as well in the book. You can have a copy online on our website. You can request for that as well as we have uh, English books that are available. So you can just send us an email on our website. Just log on to www.autismconnect.com and uh, you can just subscribe for the book and you will be uh, able to get one. Thank you so much everyone. I would really, really, really be very thankful to all of you. Thank you so much.